right, so um, I think you all have the agenda. We know what we're kind of here for. This is a safer committee, safety facilities fees and revenue subcommittee. Um, really kind of focusing tonight on capital plan and how we've done in the past, what we look at going forward, and where we kind of see we might need some town support to get some of these big projects done. All right, so first I think, I don't know if everyone knows everyone, or at least math is more challenging. So why don't we do introductions first. My name is Chris Eklund. I'm a Kingston representative of Silver Lake, and I've been here about five years. And Safer is one of my things that I kind of enjoy a lot, so. I'm Jill Pru. I'm the superintendent of schools. Oh, I'm Christine Haley, the director of business services. Matt Durkee, director of facilities, Silver Lake. Amazing person, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Sheila Vaughn. I wear two hats. I'm the chair of the Kingston School Committee, and I am also a selectman in Kingston. Kim Member, I'm the chairman of the board of selectmen. Keep on going. Perfect. Jimmy Field, middle school principal. Ryan Lynch, assistant superintendent. Uh, John Wilkinson, Plumpton Town Properties Committee. Charlie Seeley, town administrator in Halifax. Sandy Nolan, Halifax Town County. Okay. Gordon Laws, uh, Silver Lake School Committee. You want to start in the back over there, Carl? Introduce yourself so everyone knows who you are. Carl <laughs> White, the president of Kingston. Hi. And? Town Treasurer. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, Captain Gallimani. Did someone else snuck in? Former resident of Kingston. <laughs> okay, yeah. fair enough. Put a county treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you all got a lot of materials here, so we'll just go right through. I think we'll start with uh, prior E&D support and capital plan items. So um, I want to highlight Christine. She's our business manager who has sort of control of the book. So the history she knows is inside, outside, mm -hmm. and it's going to start there. If you don't mind. I do not mind. So I don't want to say control of the books, but I, <laughs> I collect information and report information. I share my information. That's what I do. Fair enough. Uh, so in the package, uh, this is a page number two, three, and four, the ones we're going to look at right now. The first page is just kind of a snapshot of our, um, what we've done with the ED since we've had the, the consolidated effort to work on our capital plan. So you'll see each year from 2013 through the last time our ED was certified for July 1, 2020, what our certified ED was, and then what our capital, capital um, plan usage was for that year. And then over to the right, I'll show you what the E&D balance was following that certification. So for June 30, 2020, our E&D will be assessed, will be determined based off of that. It'll be effective for July 1, 2021. And once it's, once it's certified, we then will have the ability to use that E&D. Um, the next page, um, again, is, is one of the items that we wanted to share with everybody is our, the E&D revenue that we're, not the E&D. The revenue from net metering that was accumulated since we entered into an agreement in 2014. Uh, we are part of a net metering agreement with a facility that's in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. And what happens is we purchase credits at 10 cents a kilowatt hour based on the generation of that plant. And then that, in, then that generation is then sold on the open market. So we make our money between what it's sold for versus what we purchased it for. So in the past seven years, we have just crossed over the $2 million mark with our revenue that we've earned from that, that site. And then the last page that you have is a collection of all of the projects that have been budgeted through our capital plan. And you know, I could try to get, I like to get everything on one page, and when I was doing that, I, I actually was kind of surprised that it was $4 million worth of projects that were put into this, um, the capital plan. $4 million of projects that we've been able to accomplish since we started. And I tried to organize them by type of activity so you can see that, for instance, the top of the page, in 2015, for the year 2016, we actually um, paid $24,000 to have two studies done on the middle school and the high school on how do we maintain the envelope of the building, how do we best maintain that. Since that was done, we have had an effort every single year to work towards maintaining our buildings and um, making them more wor worthy and make, making them so that they'll be able to continue and have a long life. And we've done that every single year. We had one year for 2020 where we had had some 
roof issues, but we put a, real, a lot of effort into that. We were able to bring our roofs back into warranty at that point in time. So we're continuing to maintain that we have a plan that was designed for us by the design and architect firm, and we've maintained that we've just steadily gone through that every single year. So we really put a lot of time and energy into that. And if you look at the list, you see the variety of other relatives that we've taken care of with maintaining our facilities, working on making our programs more robust, especially in the CTE area. They, you know, they need to keep up with what's happening in the outside world. What they're teaching the students has to be relevant to what's going on in the outside world. So through here, you'll just see the, just the different types of projects that we have taken on during the past seven years and have successfully completed them. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Or if you have any questions later on, you can just always email me. I'll be happy to help you. I think that's it for me, unless there are any questions. Any, this is, for, for me, this is more of a, a conversation than a presentation. So by all means, if you have questions, if you don't understand something we're going through, just type up. All right. I know we have two new people that showed up. One of our last introductions, please. Uh, Emily Davis. I'm on the Silver Lake Regional School Committee. Jeff? All right, thank you. Oh, Gordon, you're stopping behind me. There we are. Thank you. Um, so one reason sort of to bring this meeting together is, and I'll highlight the E&D e account. Um, we've been funding our capital plan every year through that, for those of you who aren't aware. And as Christine highlighted, we have a certified amount every year, and we have the usage. Um, we did have a great year in 15 in terms of being able to give money back to the towns through separation with uh, Pembroke. But I think one concern we have is we look at the last couple years, we kind of get in, you know, that five to eight hundred thousand, and we spend that five plus every year towards project and capital plans. And that balance might work for a while, but when we have projects that don't fit in that five hundred thousand dollar scope, we need to know what to do. We need some sort of guidance, input um, on how to address these concerns with the, with the town. So that's one that I think is an important one to sort of keep handy um, throughout the conversation. We do have sort of constraints on what we can do financially on our own. Um, so I think next I'd love to have sort of Matt speak up. Those of you who don't know Matt Durkee, he's our facilities manager now. He's for the district. He's not just Silver Lake, so he helps with all, all schools across the district. Um, you've been here two years now almost? Year and a half. Year and a half. All right. Um, why don't you give us your perspective? You've been here a year. Introduce yourself to everyone because you may be one of the new members of the team here. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Matt Durkee, Director of Facilities for Silver Lake Regional School District. Um, and I was thinking about just going through our capital plan unless you would. Perfect. Sure. So um, if we want to start in 2020, 21, um, the, we start with uh, buildings. Administration building is unfunded. Um, so uh, we've addressed um, issues through our operating budget through there. Um, again, unfunded in our capital plan for that year. Um, we've continued on with the middle and high school building envelope repairs. Um, and that involves a lot of labor intensive work that's uh, removing caulking and grout, everything on the building its exterior to prevent um, environmental infiltration into the school, which can cause a greater problem. Um, so we are steadily uh, moving through those items to be addressed in both schools. Um, we also have the auditorium tile floor entrance, which right now we're in the uh, punch list phase of that. Uh, the majority of the flooring is down and um, it looks spectacular. Um, we were uh, with supply chain issues during that project. It was uh, quite trying to get this, this project completed in the time frame needed to open the building, but we were able to push through, and uh, thanks to our great custodial staff here at the, the high school, we were able to do that. Um, resurfacing of the carpentry floor has been completed. Um, I think that the CTE program is, is fairly happy with that. Um, middle school garage construction, um, that again, applying a lot of uh, uh, unknown material cost increases. We are still steadily moving through that construction. Um, and our C CTE students are out there, not currently, but during the school day out there working. 
Uh, we're close to finishing the building envelope on that. And next will come uh, electrical um, uh, for that structure. Um, grounds, parking lot and roads. Um, we, we did some coring samples out in the, the Lake Street parking lot was of concern. Um, so we did some coring samples there and um, with the contractor and uh, discussions, we determined that the parking lot wasn't in as um, bad of shape as we initially thought. So from that, we uh, addressed um, catch basins throughout the uh, campus parking lot and also identifying some um, issues with catch basins over on the middle school side, which we were able to work into that, um, that budget line there. That also included, um, with, the, with the savings of uh, tearing up the existing Lake Street parking lot and repaving it, we were able to uh, focus on the catch basins and then um, crack fill and seal and then restripe that parking lot. That's over to uh, over my left shoulder, the Lake Street um, parking lot. Um, WDA, the Athletic Grounds Master Plan, um, that was a, uh, a very in-depth assessment done of our athletic facilities in its entirety. And we worked with, uh, we contracted with a company, Activitas, um, uh, our athletic director uh, and myself have been working with them to kind of prioritize items in there um, that would best suit our, our students and all, all students and um, athletic body. Um, so we are uh, currently working through the prior prioritization of that assessment to see, and again, um, looking, um, seeing where we need to focus uh, any help on that. Um, the tennis courts, that was uh, one of the priority lists from that assessment, and that was to be um, uh, remodeled as far as the entire surface was going to be removed. That included the uh, fencing and access to it. Um, we were uh, not able to proceed with that complete remodel, so we have, uh, in order to proceed with our athletic um, events on that surface, we, this spring, um, crack filled and sealed those areas. Um, so athletics was able to continue. Um, let's see here, some of these items were moved to the next year. Again, if there's any questions as I'm going along, please don't hesitate to, to speak up and ask. Um, or again, you can email me and we can, we can chat about that as well. Is the present track renovation stuff or whatnot, is that on you? Uh, which one are which one? It was moved, I believe, in 2023. It's, it's, right now, the track is actually under construction. They're doing drainage and the field. That's the yeah. field yeah. inside the track. Yeah. So we've got that. That's coming. Uh, let's see. So, I, yeah. so uh, the last uh, item on that list there for in the safety and security was the radio repeaters. Um, that gave us the ability to communicate uh, via radio across all three towns. Um, so that, uh, that gives us the, the speed to communicate in an emergency um, through all, all of our schools, Plimpton, Halifax, and Kingston, and Silver Lake. Um, as far as the equipment, um, the CTE program instructional equipment, the hydraulic metal shear, shear has been uh, received and installed. And the iron working station was moved. Yeah, the shear was a $70,000 piece of equipment that I think we got this summer. And those, those are usually long life equipment. Remember the, the CTE wing? In tech education, there's some pretty big machines that, that are very old. Like the floor is getting down from 76. There's some 40 year old piece of machinery in there that when they break, they just can't be bandaged back together and we need to have, spend some significant capital towards those. 
Um, I would commend the administration and Matt and the rest of the people here who work on these things when we allocate funds and we come in under budget, where you see some of these safety items partially paid for by safety grants. That's, that's the administration taking the effort to try and find alternate funding sources for these. Uh, when I look back at 19 and 20, it's on here. There are two items that were moved into the operating budget because they kind of sprung on us. Uh, the high school water heaters went down. Um, it was an ironic situation that the, they were set up back to back and the one at the back wall broke and failed, so we had to replace them both mid-year. So they weren't necessarily end of life, but we had to come up with the $60,000 through the administration's efforts of cutting and getting that done. Um, and the wastewater treatment plant was as well a nice expense that we need to prepare on the fly. You can't let that wait. Um, and that was in there too in 1920. So, so the question on the track, do you want to address what we're doing there in the infield? Sure. So um, the track it was, uh, and the infield itself was, was the main area of concern. Um, we felt that it was a safety issue with the, um, the grass itself was, was, was retaining water uh, more so than normal. So that was causing a lot of our uh, mowing equipment to sink into the turf. Then the mower decks will then hit the grass and it's scalping the, the grass. Um, any type of practices that are out there when you're repeating the same movement in the same area was really digging up the turf. So that um, needed to be addressed. So what we've done there, uh, and it wasn't the track that was shut down, we shut down the track um, in order to safely move equipment across our valuable track that we're trying um, to maintain for years to come. So we were running our equipment across that track and we shut down the whole track in order to um, make it a safe uh, passage for the machinery and also safe for the community that generally likes to use our track. Um, that uh, material used to tr cross over the track would have it created a tripping hazard, so that's why we had shut the track down during this uh, process, which is now complete in that uh, quadrant of the field. So what we did there was uh, peel back the existing turf, remove uh, a lot of material that had been left from the original construction. We've installed uh, drainage piping and catch basins to now allow uh, uh, water, standing water to now escape and has been, uh, uh, turf has been laid back over that and all reports now are that it's, there's a tremendous difference and it's holding up very well and that field uh, should be opened up for use to our students and to the town within the next week. We're just waiting on confirmation from the installer to give us that, that go ahead because if we go too soon we risk damaging the turf we just laid down. Uh, that's the inside the track. Thank you. Uh, well, you know you'll probably hear more about the administration building at some point here, but I'd highlight that we had to put $50,000 into rear windows and floors. Jill, you want to talk about your windows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, so our, our windows had um, begun to fail, and some were labeled do not open. Um, but some were not labeled do not open. So if you were new to your position, let's say perhaps in 2020 when you first started and you opened up a window, um, it, it came right down on you. Um, and so the windows were failing and we, we talked about it as a, um, a, a safer committee in, in terms of we needed to start making some decisions about maintaining this building because we knew that we were going to be working in this building and there's certain things that had to be addressed. Um, so we have had plumbing issues um, where we haven't had um, you know, functioning um, bathrooms and we've, we, we had the window issues so we've replaced some of those. Um, and we're, we're trying to be as responsible and fiscally conservative as possible but there, there also comes a point where the, the building needs to function safely as well. So those are some of the things that we're um, putting some money into to make it a usable, safe, and safe place. Um, but there are also some things that, um, that the study by Habib and Associates kind of illustrated that to get beyond just a safe place to work, we need the space to function effectively and to house the staffing that we have um, and our records and to be ADA compliant. And so there's a, there's a whole host of issues that in a, in a perfect world, the building would, would function in that way beyond just 
we don't have to fear our fingers um, being slammed in the windows. So we're, we'll talk to you about that tonight. We're not at a place where we can make a recommendation for that building, but we've taken some preliminary steps to begin to investigate um, what some possibilities may be. Thank you. Can we sort of quickly go through the 22, 23 sort of scheduled capital plan, if you don't mind? You got okay, so you want to skip over 21, 22? Well, 21, 22, we did the field. We just did the building up top for the $50,000 window, the admin. Um, inside track we covered. Mm -hmm. We do some safety security again. Um, and I think the dust collector, I think, is pretty clear um, in the work, wood shop. We need to get the dust out of there. And that's a, I think it was a 40 year old machine that just. There's, there is one, one item on here is the, uh, the tennis courts that I, I think could use a little more information. Sure. Perfect. Um, because there have been questions on um, the subsurface at the tennis court. Um, so we've gone back down through our, our, our plans and uh, there wasn't because we had cracking on the tennis court, um, long running cracking. And there was a fear that um, there was a section of the wastewater treatment plant that was underneath that structure and that might have been causing the cracking. So the fear was why would we replace this entire surface for a large, um, dollar amount if it's only going to happen again. So going through the plans and then speaking with the um, Activitas professionals there and their assessment, the plans indicate that there is there is nothing there. Um, the original thought was it was a holding tank. And what the plans show, it was it's a reserve area for a leaching field. So there is no vault or tank under that surface. And what Activitas has um, uh, assessed is those tr the, the cracking in the tennis court is falls right in line with the width of a paving machine. So you expect to get 15 to 25 years out of a parking lot, much the same as a tennis court. So these seams that are coming apart are actually uh, the cracks that are showing are the seams of where that um, asphalt machine has laid down a path and where it meets up against the next um, path that's laid down. So over the years, it's natural that those seams will weather the most, and then they'll start to spread. And with um, you know water infiltration, freezing, and thawing, those cracks will open up even more. Um, so the end result is now we're we're running um, sealing uh, crack sealing through there to get us through. Um, but with Activitas's expertise, we do know now know that by replacing the entire surface of that track, it's, we don't have to worry about a structure underneath affecting that finished product. It would be right in line with any other um, tennis court surface and warranty for it. So I just wanted to add that to uh, the tennis court. How much life do you think we have in what we, the product in the spring? Did they give us an indication of two years, one year? No, the, the installer said, you know, this, it could be one year, it could be half a year. It all depends okay. on, uh, you know, freezing, thawing, um, environmental factors. Okay. And we use that for more than just tennis, as everyone is probably aware. Uh, Mark was here, she'd say it's using 1,500 students out there for gym class and so forth all the time. So it's not just a season. Six courts. Um, we have, the, you know, the public is welcome to use those, um, and they have... Mm -hmm. They've also voiced interest in pickleball courts, which could be in the works as well. So, Matt, does finding out that there's nothing underneath it, does that change the cost of replacing it? No, it does no. not change the cost. Okay. And that cost, that um, the, the full replacement also includes the nets, the, the finished top lining, and the fencing all the way around it. What's the present life of a tennis court? The, the current tennis court we have? Yeah. Well, we're seeing the end of the life right now. <laughs> no, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I understand that. If I, I feel like I recall from our town meeting that this had not gone nearly as long as we would have hoped with the present tennis courts. Well, um, you know, for an asphalt surface, you're looking for 15 to 25 years of use of that before you're, you're seeing substantial um, uh, deterioration of that surface. I mean, so that falls right in, in there. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Twenty-two, 
twenty-two, twenty-three. Yeah, I think we have. This is just really preliminary. We've not voted anything on twenty-two, twenty-three, but this is sort of a, a good idea of what we're looking at and oh. how we go through sort of our discussion as a committee, uh, both the subcommittee and, and the full committee, and what we can do, what we think we might be able to do, and then we have to talk to Christine and see if we have the money to do it. And, to, and one final thought on the 21 22. Uh, it was $542,970 approved for that. And the actual cost there uh, was $488,000. So in the in administration building, this uh, 22 23, we have $20,000 uh, for critical improvements. Um, to that, that building. But as you can imagine, um, a plumbing, a major plumbing project, uh, floors, windows, roof, driveway, um, accessibility, um, efficient space, use of space uh, for the function of our employees. Um, it's gonna be difficult to um, tackle a lot of those projects within this scope. Um, you know, the middle school and high school building envelope repairs, we're still continuing uh, to maintain both building envelopes um, as we're just finishing up uh, the high school. Uh, the next, uh, next summer, again, it will be another uh, out to bid process and we'll be continuing to, to really shore up the building envelope. Um, and that's, you can, we can look at that as a, a preventative maintenance uh, because that is the, that is the, uh, the protection for inside the building. If anything fails outside the building, the failures inside the building are, are quite costly. Now, what were you working on this summer under that scope? This summer was what we were doing. the high school, and uh, for instance, we have uh, right here was one of the windows that was, was replaced, a very specific window. If you, you know, look closely to this window, it has these little dots in the window, so that was difficult to track down. But, um, Nadu was the contractor. They were able to track it down. They replaced that um, upper window. And then we've moved from, uh, let's see, from the tennis court side of the CTE wing, working through all that old brick and mortar and uh, pulling out old mortar, replacing it, um, worked on uh, any type of infiltration for doors, uh, door sweeps, um, caulking in windows, seams, pulling out old caulking, replacing that, uh, matching it to the existing. And we've moved our way around the front of the building and have ended back towards the cafeteria entrance. So we'll be continuing on the rest of the building on that right. and, and then continuing with the middle school. And we had some courtyard work done because of water. We did. Um, so right outside the, the library entrance here was an ongoing issue with water infiltration underneath the window frame mm -hmm. and doors, and that was causing the interior flooring to buckle. So we have uh, t uh, removed all the concrete in front of those doors, as well as the same application in the front of the main lobby, uh, the doors to the courtyard there. What we did is we removed all that concrete, we installed a, a, a drain grate that will then channel that water up against the building away from the, the entry in the windows into a catch basin located in the grass area of the courtyard. That's the same for the, the, uh, the main lobby, had that same uh, procedure done. I like putting you in the spot, you know your stuff. <laughs> Fire away. <laughs> but those, but I wanted some color to that, that $200,000 infiltration that we're spending each and every year. It's not just roof. It's, it's leaks and so forth that right. come with a building of this age. And maybe I didn't articulate that uh, well enough, that it is very labor intensive. A project like this is, um, the, there's obviously a cost for material, but we're talking about running, you know, two, two and a half stories up removing caulking, removing grout. Uh, uh, so you're, you're up on a structure, you got the lifts going, and you're methodically moving through this building on the exterior, which takes a lot of time. Perfect. Where are we with the roofs? Everything's under the warranty. Is there any point in the next few years that we're going to keep out of the warranty? We brought our 
the roofs back to warranty, but they are past their warranty stage now. So what we're, what we're looking to do is have a, um, a preventive maintenance review every year, just to have the, the professionals walk through our roofs to see if there's anything that's coming to their attention. Because we do talk, call them if anything does happen, if the, we do find any leaks. But we want to make sure that there's nothing obvious that's happening to our roof. So we, we, we're looking to have an annual review to assess that. Do we know where we are on a replacement timeline from them? I mean, they will get the uh, uh, when, when the roofs were last done, I, I have the impression that they were pretty, if we brought them back into the warranty status, they were in pretty good condition. And that's for right now. We just need to continue to put an effort into maintaining that as part of our envelope work every year. Yeah, the replacement hasn't jumped on our, our capital plan conversation yet, to my knowledge, in terms of doing the whole building. Um, right. Uh, obviously, it will at some point, I suppose. Hopefully not way for, up. for some time. Some time, way up, hopefully. And we are very happy. We're, we're working with a, uh, a roofing company um, that I have worked close, closely with in the past. Um, they have... They were simultaneously working here at the high school while I was working with them in, in Halifax. They've been very responsive and uh, uh, give a detailed assessment of the, of the work that they do here. Um, so moving forward with our roofs, um, I feel like we're in really good shape with uh, the company we've been using for some of these smaller fixes or any type of problems that we, or questions we may have. Um, We've had uh, uh, a high level of success with this company. Um, um, can I just to Gordon to your point when we were looking at the Dennett roof a couple years ago? I think the number we got back was 25 to 27 years from MSBA from, from mm -hmm. to getting that getting some funding to it. So yes, Kingston's going through that right now for our elementary roof, and you know we tried for 20. And they kind of laughed and said, uh -huh, we're going to yeah. give you another five years yeah. and see if you come back. 20 was okay until the fire marshal had everyone shovel the roots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then everyone had a hole in their roots. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you're, you, that's rough, and of course it changes year to year depending on what they have for funding. But Matt's been awesome. He even got our, he got our, our, our HVAC, he even put a little space in there to replace the roof. He's so smart. Oh, in, in Kingston? <laughs> yeah, in Kingston. Yeah. Well, the, the HVAC, the, the, the Kingston, that's an MSBA project, and that's mm -hmm. it's currently going on now. Yeah. Um, uh, and with Jill's gu guidance, we've been um, we've submitted to MSBA for the Kingston Elementary roof, um, which has been it's been a repeat submittal. But now this year, we've 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 also submitted for windows, siding, and doors. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't think siding was a. Is it now? Yes, it was with Halifax. Mm -hmm. We did windows. We did windows, doors, and It's the fire doors. suppression that right. wasn't included. I think, mm -hmm. I, what I remember is also... We made that on, on the side. Yeah, I think we the did. windows yeah. and doors were covered. But the siding wasn't. The siding wasn't covered for yeah, MSBA. Qualified. Maybe they've changed. That's possible. Yeah. Um... So I think the next two items are the track, track, and the baseball field, which again come sourced to us from the Activitas. So, so the track uh, in, this, in this past spring, um, we had it assessed by, uh, I believe it was the original installer. The installer, yes. Um, we are still waiting on some um, actual language on their assessment, but they, um, they said we were, it was in good working order. Um, and we're, like I said, we're still waiting on their written assessment, but um, it gave us some confidence to uh, not um, put that up at one of the higher priorities that we're working with here. Um, the scoreboard sound system um, sponsor video. Um, uh, Martha Jameson, our athletic director, um, is working through that along with myself in the SAFER subcommittee. Um, exploring different options to um, fund that project. Um, the JV baseball field, uh, that is uh, potentially happening this spring, early spring, where um, the surface just has been, over years, has been um, uh, used 
um, very well. And now we're to the point where the outside, the, the, the field um, is very rutted and, and, and bumpy. So we're looking to have that tilled, reseeded, rolled. Um, we did, we, we're finding that over the years as you're, as you're renovating these uh, athletic fields, especially base paths, um, when you're you're at you're constantly adding materials, so then that's creating um, almost like curbing on on the pathways, which we felt was a safety concern, and we um, we addressed that by shaving that down and, and restart and and reforming that, so it's it's no longer a safety uh, concern with those base paths. But the out, the JV baseball field, which is down uh, below Syrico, um, we were hoping to. Um, till that, level it, um, and and reseed. As, as highlight on the scoreboard, those parts on that scoreboard out there are not available. So if we have too much of that break, it won't be functioning. So we're kind of, from I think Martha's perspective, we may be on borrowed time every season to season, but again, it, it hasn't quite come to a priority here to get us done, but Martha's in matter of working on some sponsorship opportunities to get that replaced. Similar to the lights that we had back in uh, 19, I think it was, we had an urgent call in the summer that the posts for lighting out in Syracuse were uh, unsafe. And that was sort of an unacceptable thing to the community, and it got done. Um, it came done through funding, through uh, adjustments in our capital plan, and through sponsorships and so forth out in the community. So we don't like to take that route, but um, it does happen, and it is great that we get support when needed on some of these things. Uh, equipment, uh, pickup truck at the middle school, um, 98 vehicle. Uh, we're doing the best we can with that vehicle at the middle school right now. Uh, we just recently replaced the gas lines and brake lines and uh, with the help of the CTE um, allowed us to do this within our operating costs. And um, we are now uh, working on the bed replacement for that. and. Um, that should be ready for when the snow starts flying to aid in our snow removal around campus. Uh, air compressor. I can't really speak to that. Uh, Elliot, I think, has said it's a sort of foundational to making the tools operate, even though mm -hmm. the compressor does. So yes. when it goes down, the classroom kind of goes down. Uh, and I think it's the end of life for sure in there. These are just small items, but these are just part of our capital plan that we, you know, get a year or two foresight. You know, when a truck's going down, you don't get three years advance notice on that one, but this is a 98, so it's a 23-year-old truck. And, and to, <laughs> jump, to jump back up to the scoreboard, you know, that's, that was part of the Activitas um, assessment where it, it did include um, a scoreboard replacement, um, you know, some of other really priority items, um, you know, some ADA compliance um, and other features that uh, would benefit the community. Um, and I believe it's included in your packet different different approaches to that athletic grounds, which would include that scoreboard as well. As a conservative financial manager, I would suggest that we don't need video on the scoreboard. Yes, I can. I can definitely see your point, and that was and that was my and that was my first knee jerk reaction to when I saw the video. But then, the idea of graduation and events like that, where you have folks that are far away and they cannot see what's going on on stage. So, if we were to to invest the time, energy, and resources to bring this facility up to what we really want. Um, it's my now um, personal thought that that would be a direction to go is with the video. But I do see your concern, 100%. I think that also feeds into being able to sell ads between periods, Correct. before a game, after a game, whenever. So it is the revenue, 30 second spot that we can put out there for people. Do we have any idea what the difference in price would be with or without video? Yeah, it looks like we've got an estimate so. in the red margin there, 75 grand. Oh. 
Do you know any more on that, Michaela? Yes, that's about right. But again, the, there's a company that we met with last week, Power Ad, that works with soliciting companies to put up the funding to put it up. So the only local responsibility would be for installation. Correct. The actual scoreboard and video will be funded through advertising. And then once that is paid for, you then can generate revenue to support it, which is And that's 75, if it's that 75, um, with the video, that would be our installation cost. The cost of the material, the equipment, the um, would be part of that sponsorship um, agreement that we would reach into. And I believe there were a few different tiers in between as well. There's, there's actually, I think, three or four different tiers. Yeah, we can go big and fancy, Carl. Yes. <laughs> you want that? <laughs> um, I'll speak on technology real quick. Um, as everyone probably knows or maybe not know, um, we're a one-to-one -one device district. So both the middle school and high school, every student has a device. And as we've learned through sort of the COVID of the last year and a half, um, the devices are key, but we need to have in the school the ability to support all those Chromebooks logging in. Um, so we've made a commitment, at least in the last five years that I've been here, to maintaining and keeping the network running, uh, both from a security perspective, a functionality perspective. And as you can see on, on this line item here, that we have $78,000 for the classrooms, for projectors. And I, I saw this line item up there, and I kind of had to make sure I had my glasses on, I was looking at it right, you know. It, it's a three to five year expectancy, and we're year eight or nine. So what our tech team does here is always amazing to me, but these are things that are, are sort of foundational capital plan items, if you will, to, to the school these days. It's, it's not something we don't, we don't we really can't ignore it almost. Because if the systems go down, we have, I think, educational issues. Um, Air Ohio's feet right into that, I don't know what they do really. And of course, you know, the firewall is important. I think it gives in mind it here. So, there's only one line on the back side of that. It's $690,000. So, if we look at Christine's materials she provided in terms of what our excess and deficiency are, might be or has been, and we have 690 as our preliminary capital plan, um, we had $675,000 in our account in 2020. So we've overspent. We have a number similar to that. That's part of our concern, I think, uh, from the committee and the administration's perspective, is we don't know if we can support everything in here. We can always move things forward and back sometimes, um, but it's a question of, of what and what the impact might be. So um, the revenue source we have is fantastic with the net metering. And the rest of it's just sort of operational efficiencies through the, the management of the school. May I, may I ask a question? Sure, um, please. Are you looking to address the tennis courts in this 2022-2023 um, funding cycle or another point? Well, um, I would prefer not to have to um, Keep putting crack filler in there at you know nine, twelve thousand dollars. It's whereas if we could um, approach it as uh, a, a complete replacement, um, you know it's nice to get those things off your desk. A project that keeps lingering um, is ultimately going to cost more money. Um, so with a, a, a tennis court remodel, that would be done and enjoyed and we would be moving on to the next. So do you anticipate adding it one of the years? Uh, well, we've brought it to the towns, and that's just an ongoing conversation. Yeah. That, that's the push and pull of the capital plan, right? If we have to put that in here, then the, the, the track resurfacing clearly probably wouldn't be there. Um, and I think the quotes we had to fix it versus replace it were 100 and 300, I think. Uh, I'll get the number somewhere buried in front of me. So. When we went, when we went to, with Activitas last year, they recommended and saw the issue. Um, we didn't want to wait, but again, a $10,000 Band-Aid might get us a year. Maybe we can do that $10,000 Band-Aid and get another year, but I think it's, it's inevitable on the front end here somewhere. Um, and if it's 300 grand to replace it, that's a decision that the district and the towns want to go with. That's half of our capital plan. We do that and we do $200,000 to protect the buildings. That's 500. 
what else can we continue to maintain um, or not maintain because we really don't have the funding. You know, we can't go past the E&D. We just have no ability to do that. And if E&D comes in low, then, then we expect or hope, then we're even tighter. And that's why I think the towns need to be aware of this because we don't want to have to sort of put restrictions on ourselves without the town knowing that that might be coming. And it's not, it's not just the cracks. You know, it's, yeah. you can see, you know, if you're looking at it, finance, well, sure, we'll just keep dumping $10,000 a year into this and we should be good. But it's not just the cracks. It's the overall surface. It's the equipment out there. The nets are sagging. The chain link fence needs work. So it's a it's a it's a whole project approach um, that needs to be looked at and addressed. It's not just the cracks themselves. That's the safety issue, which we obviously need to address and did address immediately, in order to make it gameplay um, safe and safe for the for the uh, townspeople to use. Um, I'll just move this along in terms of 23, 24. The only item that I want to sort of highlight there is the two HVAC units, which are, as a verbal estimate, 150 each. They're replacements um, at the high school, and that's about 300 grand. So again, when we get those $300,000 items, give or take what it might be in a year, it, puts us in a, it could put us in a bind. Um, I know HVAC is for a later conversation, possibly, but I just want to highlight that our 23, 24 big ticket item that we sort of kind of place there as a, as a replacement of need. Any questions yet so far on, on sort of the run-of-the-mill stuff, I'll say? Oh, good. good, good. Oh, yes, sorry. The building envelope looks like it's ongoing $200,000 a year. Yeah. Why not set the operating budget as a maintenance? Because what you described is more of an ongoing maintenance type just to free up capital. I suppose if the towns want us to add that to our operational budget, we could, but then it wouldn't be at that expected two to two and a half percent, you know, year over year increase. You, you need to account for that two hundred thousand dollar operating expense. I mean, to us it's capital because when we did the evaluation of the envelope, I think it was a two million dollar number we had, and we said we can't do that. So we said, okay, can we do it in two hundred thousand dollar increments to bring things back up? That's part of the roof, as Gordon mentioned, getting it back under. You know, uh, policy and so forth. So, is there an end date to the $200,000 yearly thing? It sounded like it was yeah. a revolving kind of. I think this was the first <coughs> of sort of an ongoing maintenance for the campus. I mean, the campus isn't really that old. So, the first 10 years, you don't really have much going on for maintenance. Now we're starting to discover things like leaks that evolved. And it almost feels like it's going to be an ongoing thing. I don't know if you guys have better taste of that. I, I agree that each year, we, when that was originally done, the study was done, it, it brought things to our attention that would need to be maintained on an ongoing basis, like you would do with your home. So we made a committed effort to continue with that. And sometimes things pop up and become more critical than others. They weren't even on our plan. But the plan is a systematic approach to maintain the, the structure of the buildings. And I agree with you, it's, it's going to continue on. When we did this in 2015, when we did the study, if we did it in 25 again, that may be a different list because there may be different types of items that we would need to start to look at based on a more current evaluation. And I agree with you, that was our way of, made, of de dealing with that $2 million <laughs> ticket Gift. item that we couldn't, yeah, we couldn't take care of that all at once, so we came up with a systematic approach to work with that. And I agree, it's, it will continue and continue. I mean, we could put an operation that the town's finance committee as well wants to, wants to accept it that way. Gordon, you got a thought on that one? Um, it's not going to work with in the town budgets. I mean, right now, so it's increasing about $650,000 a year in mm -hmm. budget. So just for all the facts alone, if you're at the third, it's $200,000 a year. It's half of our property and half. Mm -hmm. So how fast can we get a real line when our enrollment percentage changes when Jill sends out its first cheap bond? I wish Halifax luck went up or down then for the census. <laughs> so, I agree that the $200,000 is an ongoing cost that we need to think about moving some of that cost inside the operating budget. The problem is, you know, I've sat on their side yep. in the past three years, you've got to make a decision. If you're going to pull that cost from then, you've got to change the program studies because you're right people. You're going to attract the students. And that's where it's going to be. So that, that needs to be a decision moving forward. If you're going to hold that in, if you're not going to have the EMP 
funds, you're going to have to change the program. Just concerns, I totally agree on the lateness that needs to have this occurred, it's the most issue to have to exact thing. And yeah. to take a more realistic approach, if you know that there is that ongoing need to maintain building the top, it's just a hard thing to do. Yeah. It, it is, it, it, I think it feels more like an operating thing. So when we look at the 200 every year, it is not a clearly defined punch list. We have an idea, I think, in a scope of what would be priorities in that. Fair to say, Matt? Yes. But we can't define it like a pickup truck or a lawnmower or a CNC machine. It's not that finite. Um, yeah, I think when we had our, our 2015 list, yeah, we could have probably come to the town and said we need $2 million to preserve what we got. And we bonded it or whatever might have been necessary. But it doesn't mean that now, five years later from 15, we wouldn't also have other maintenance-like issues. It's sort of like maintaining a house. You know, You just have things that come up. Where the front steps run, okay, we replace the front steps. The deck needs replaced, right? The next year, replace the deck. It's sort of incremental things due to age and usage. So uh, I like your thinking, and I wish the towns could accept that. And we can certainly try and have that conversation in the, in the spring in terms of maybe it's not 200 that we push into the operating budget if it's acceptable. Maybe it's just like 50 grand off of our capital need into the operating. I'm, I'm happy to sort of have those conversations. So thank you. Chris, I Sure. So I, I run both sides of the house myself, and so it, it, it is tough because when you're going to town meeting regarding maintenance, it is a difficult situation because you have all three towns. And so, you know, it's not just my town that I have to look at and say, okay, Kingston is going to pay for this. It's all three towns. So you have to have, you know, two out of three towns say yes. And sometimes one town won't say yes, and they're like, well, well now we have to pay for this. So it's a tough situation to go to three town meetings and for maintenance. And to me, maintenance is, is safety, and that's one of the things that I, I worry about, you know, safety concerns. That's something that I don't think should sometimes go to a town meeting. It just needs to be fixed because it's a safety concern. So, you know, maintenance of these buildings is important, you know. Um, you know, the roof, for instance, you know, you can patch it all you want, but at some point you have to replace it, right? So there are certain things that you worry, it's worrisome. I think 200,000 is a lot to kind of put in at first and say, okay, can you mm -hmm. take it to an operating budget? Like you said, having those conversations like we're doing here, I think it's important to have those conversations about what is considered in this 200,000. What are those things that you are working on mm -hmm. and what could be moved to an operating budget as compared to, you know, other things in this in this aspect. So, you know, what what is being used for that 200,000 as compared to, you know, the track, or is it, or is it, you know, mm -hmm. is it windows? Is it something that is a safety concern? Like fingers being smashed into windows. You know, those, <laughs> those are those are big concerns yeah. to me. So that I, needs to be an operating budget type of situation. If she's going to have her fingers smashed. Yeah. I think. <laughs> I think, in my opinion, when we talk about the operating budget, it's hard to put in, um, you know, windows and doors and, and repairs, because operating needs to really fund the education. So mm -hmm. if we can fit it in, that's great. But as a capital plan project or as a district's responsibility, we have the E&D &E to use, and we're choosing, I guess, to use it to make sure that the facility is maintained. That's also part of our responsibility. You know, we can't use a library if the, if the roof leaks. Well, that means that the kids can't get to what they need to do to learn. Part of education is the building. It is, it is. So it is that, it is that decision, I guess, Joe, correct me or agree with me, that we choose to own it as much as we can and that precipitates the meeting. There are things here that we just can't own anymore. And our, our next list will have plenty of those to kind of digest. And, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. And, and, and we recognize the, the expense and the difficulty that this poses for our towns and communities. And so that that's the reason for this meeting, to try to begin that um, collaboration and communication to try to think about ways to most appropriately address them. We also recognize that as a regional system, there are substantial savings in the way that this, this regionalization helps save the town's money, um, and that they, they gain a lot from sharing um, this centralized campus. Um, and so we want to work with you also to foster that sense of ownership and understanding as well. Um, because we have the benefit of sitting through all the town meetings uh, and seeing the support um, from from the communities for their schools. I don't know if it's a bad thing, really. <laughs> and, and so one of the things we want to try to do and, and prove upon us is this shared understanding of the, the Silver Lake Regional Schools. And um, 
what our what our needs are or what our anticipated needs may be and foster that communication so that we go about it responsibly and thoughtfully understanding um, to the best of our ability the needs of our our three towns as well mm -hmm. go ahead, Gordon, you got more? So I was going to ask Christine a question what, what years fiscal years do the debt payments involve? I actually brought that with me it stops falling up I believe in I think 25 a small piece, 26 another chunk, and at the end of 27 our debt is completely paid off. So I think that that's part of the puzzle here too, mm -hmm. talking about, when you talk about a long term plan of five years, you know that that debt payment falls off the tax rolls, so we're going to talk about that exclusion from our items at that point in time, you know, can you get the tax court to a certain point, mm -hmm. you make it so that we can exclude that year, and when it falls off, it is and when you were in the committee I know we chat about this is, is when the debt falls do we have needs on the campus that need replaced that's what he so this, this conversation tonight about the administration building comes in that's not going to fit in the budget it's not going to fit in capital plan it's not going to fit with the town any one year of a oh, let's throw it in there from free cash I think it's an expense that we probably just maybe too large so yeah that might be another debt and it would be great from a well, fiscal management perspective, my group going 100% to see debt fall off for X amount and then debt come on to match the X amount to then improve what we have here with some of these long life things like a building or a track or a tennis court or whatever might be on the list that year. Or going forward. Should we twist and turn to the admin building? Yes. All right. I have, um, before we start, I have the report from OB if anyone's interested in peeking at it. We can also send it to you. It's, it's got, oh, we included that one? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't get that far. All right. So I have an extra one. You want to go on with your, your admin building, I'll call it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so in your packet, you'll see projects outside of the capital plan. And um, on the first page, you'll find a summary. Uh, we tried to take the, a, a brief summary of the findings from Habib and Associates, uh, a summary of their findings about the space in general, and then a cost estimate that was done in 2018. Three years ago, uh, the SAFER committee began to think about um, what, what they wanted to do or what was uh, a responsible way of going about um, addressing the needs of this aging building. And uh, there are basically three options that they outline in this report. One is to renovate, one is to relocate, and the third is to replace in kind. Um, what, what I'd like to, to note, because I, I don't want to just read through all the findings for you, um, but if you look at the report to renovate the existing building, they basically just show you the, 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 the floor plan basically as it is right now, which does not address the accessibility issue, and it does not address the inefficient and unbalanced use of space. It really just renovates the building to make it a, pleasant, a more pleasant space to be in, uh, which isn't necessarily going to meet the goals. Um, but nonetheless, they provided us with a probable cost for that, just to make, make the building look nicer and to replace some of the deficient mechanical and electrical systems. Um, option 2A and 2B is a relocation to the middle school. And they came up with two options that were cost effective um, or less costly. Um, one of the things that I would caution us is that if we were to relocate into a building, I wouldn't want to just base that on census data. I would recommend a demographic study, something more detailed, something more robust, to make that kind of a decision. Because what you don't want to do is to um, spend money on, on reconfiguring the middle school, only to find out three years, five years down the road that you have to displace your administrative staff because you had a population boom or something unanticipated. So a demographic study would be a more detailed way of looking at potential fluctuations in your population for a longer term. Um, and then the third option is to replace the building. And again, there is no architectural design or study that is attached to this report that would basically um, speak to the needs and the functions of the building. And so, again, I, I see this as a, as a starting point to give people a general idea of what some of the anticipated costs could be for any of these types of things. But I caution that there's a lot more work that would need to be done before we would feel comfortable making any recommendation 
and engaging in next steps. But we wanted to nonetheless share this information with you because we do recognize that we're with aging and failing mechanical and electrical systems, we're, we're, we're on borrowed time and we don't know when certain things will go and will have to be addressed and invested into a building that we know doesn't uh, meet the needs of a, a modern school system administration building. Um, the second page was put together um, with the help of our athletic director and it just highlights the different options um, in the Activitas uh, estimates and I we went over many of those things um, but they're highlighted here for you and we're happy to try to answer any questions you may have. They include the tennis court renovation options, the Syraco field renovations, uh, track renovations and lower parking lot um, middle school improvements uh, with the two areas highlighted there as potential projects and then bathroom water electrical installed to lower athletic fields. Um, those are all outlined there. Again, expensive items uh, that, that we have begun to discuss and begin to consider in terms of the needs or um, uh, demands um, that are placed upon us when, when systems fail. So one of the things that we had um, presented, and, and we recognized that it was not well received, but one of the ideas that we had come up with was the, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's also in your packet, you should have a copy, it's the Advisory on Regional School District Stabilization Funds, mm -hmm. which is from the Department of Education. And um, we presented it as a way to try to help smooth some of these anticipated larger capital expenses. And we wanted to present it again tonight not as um, the only way to address these types of issues, but as a kind of a starting point, a conversation point of other ideas that the towns or communities may have that may help us to, to meet these ongoing needs for our schools. And I also wanted to say, forgive me, thank you all for being here tonight on behalf of our schools and spending time with us. We, we do appreciate that. Great. So I, I wanted to open it up to any comments or ideas that you may have with regards to stabilization um, or other, other areas that we might want to consider pursuing. Well, I'll speak to this one tonight. I'm going to tell you that I'm not in favor of it. Um, I think the feeling for us was that um, we are a very large budget. We feel like we don't have a whole lot of control over it. And um, I like having warrant articles that you submit so that we have an opportunity to discuss the capital projects that, uh, that are outside e and <coughs> So I like the way that we're currently doing it. I just wasn't comfortable with um, establishing the stabilization fund for that reason. Fair, thank you. Yeah, I think part of our job is to bring these kind of things up. Um, it's research that we did and said, okay, this might be an option for when we have insufficient funds to fund the capital plan versus it's a, you know, a bad economic time for the towns, you know, by the way, we need to come to Halifax for an extra hundred grand. Not a good confluence of, of problems to have. Um, so that's all it was, just a conversation. If there's other ways to do this, like we're going say when the debt falls off, we add debt to build some of these bigger projects, that, that would work well. Um, but some products don't quite qualify, I think, for debt in particular. So we have to look at other options. So one of the issues with the articles is all three towns have to vote for it. We are able to have chose to put a project within their budget. Two towns will address the burden of the judge. So that is an option for the Southern as well. It just creates an issue of two towns both know to it. Management people who was in favor of it. 
I believe that uh, Silver Lake has traditionally had a lot of autonomy over their capital plan. They managed to fund the capital plan out of their um, internal uh, funds. Of course, we all need to recognize that we're at the stage now where the E&D pretty much comes from the operating budget. It's, it's what isn't expended in the operating budget, plus your special revenues like the solar panels. But in any case, I think a stabilization fund is a reasonable approach with the only caveat that it needs to be a line item in the budget that is funded every year. Not funded just because this year we have some extra, then uh, next year we don't have anything so we don't fund it. But I do think it's something worth considering and worth you know, continuing to talk about. Just that, that is the only way we could do it. We would have to budget that line in our budget every year. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And just one other thought, sort of picking up on what Gordon was saying earlier. You know, if it's too much to put something like maintenance of the 200,000 maintenance in there, you know, and then you're mixing again, sort of E and D with program. Mm -hmm. But if you look through the, you know, through the documentation tonight, some of the stuff that's in E and D is actually program. So equipment for CTE mm -hmm. is part of the program. I sure. mean, I know it's equipment, but mm -hmm. so an alternative approach may be to take a smaller amount, put it into the budget for CTE, where you know that you're going to have things that are going at a period of time, if you mm -hmm. can possibly get a number on that. Machines lasting 40 years is awesome, but it also doesn't help you plan. Correct. Because they might not last 40 years. It might have been made enough. Monday morning, and mm -hmm. they didn't do something right. So, yeah. but I, it's just something maybe to think about that that then sort of becomes part of the overall program that you can and you can adjust that year to year. Yeah, I think it'd be great to kind of get some of in the offering, but I think that's the, the debate we've had every every year at downtown meeting is we're trying to keep the budget tight. Uh, frankly, we don't have that opportunity to slide another piece over. Right. That's what it'll take. They, okay, yeah. Year one, we've got to take the. $75,000 of CTE, ongoing equipment maintenance, whatever you want to call it, and slide that into the budget, well, now we're at a 3.5 increase, and no town's going to be too thrilled with that, unless they, they and the townspeople at, at town meeting recognize the, the mechanics of that. And it's hard to recognize a $100,000 slide in our budget. Yeah. The budget. At some point, though, it seems like the numbers are going to, the lines are going to cross in the chart. And then we're either going to have to figure mm -hmm. it out, yeah. uh, or is it better to do something incremental Mm -hmm. you know, at a smaller piece so that we can push those lines, push those that crossings out a bit. Yeah. Um, Carl, to your point on funding our capital, we actually, our capital plan for the E&D is about 50% from operational savings, if you will, and about 50% from revenue, primarily from that net metering arrangement. So when I saw that report from Christine that we've gotten $2 million in net metering money out of a $4.7 million capital plan the last several years, the school committee before me that designed that and took on that net metering project was smart, I'd say, and had some foresight to get that going. But I don't know if that's going to be an eternal uh, opportunity for us on that project. It's a solar array. I don't know how long solar arrays last, I don't know how long they're profitable, I don't know how long cash flow survives. They say a 20 year life. So, and how many years are we into it? 20 year life. Time. Yeah, exactly. Time. It's less efficient. So, that's not a each right, and so each year it decreases about uh, half of a percent of okay. the generation. Yeah. But as talking as a parent, as a, as a student who's in, uh, doing the evaluation at the CTE this year as a freshman, I think it's very important that we do have um, the best equipment possible and technology possible for these students so that they go, they're able to go into a field, that they're, un, they're able to uh, have the best possible equipment. I mean, not having you know, the most up-to-date equipment is scary, you know, and you don't want that to break down on them. And I think it's very important that, um, especially, you know, we have the CNAs, they just graduated. I mean, that's huge. Like, that, that's a huge dynamic right there. We, we brought in Allied Health. That's a huge dynamic here. That's a very expensive program, by the way. Um, but it's also bringing students into it, have jobs and be able to do that. I think it's very important that CTE, because some schools don't have these amazing programs, and I think it's important that we are being able to um, keep up with that equipment and being able to keep up 
with each of the, the programs that we have. And I think LA does a great job and it's a, it's a great program, but it's also very important that you can't go to town meeting and say, I need you know, a new machine. That's just part of the program that has to be funded. And I mean, those things like end of life, that's important to have. And I just don't want to see those things fall off the radar or be able to not be funded. That's a huge dynamic of keeping a student, just like you know, having books and having textbooks, they need their machinery. It's just the same thing. So, yeah. CTE is, is a unique department um, in some of their needs, but Elliot and the team there find grants everywhere. They've got a new greenhouse in their grant. Um, some of the equipments for the, the landscaping and sport and culture department are, are amazing. They're not small pieces of equipment. It's like we could run a, a lumber mill out there, believe it or not. Um, but it does take a commitment every now and again to, to fund it. And in the, the students that go through that are, are trying to get into those, those programs. And you'll find out the, the Allied Health was started on a grant program. Now we fund it in the budget. And it has been oversubscribed, I think, since day one. Too many kids want in, we just don't have space for it. You have any more insight on that, Kayla? I know you're nodding with me there. Well, I would agree. And I would also just remind everyone that our director of CTLA class, I mean, he has, his Hercules efforts year to find that grant money to support all of its programs. So a lot of it is funded from outside sources. So if something is proposed in the capital plan, it's because there is no other way to, to fund it and it is an absolute necessity to support that program. It's not just a, a wish list. <laughs> it's a must list, is what we call it. I, I know we talk about this at the school committee level, with each of the schools, but I think it would be, I think it's really important to put together uh, a list each year when going out to FinCon and back to the towns to show what you're asking for the budget. I think we should be highlighting how much money is coming in via grants. And I, I, don't, I think, if nothing else, I think it helps to, for those that are paying attention at the town level, and not necessarily just FinCon or Selectman, but for pe town people to understand how much of government right now is being funded via grants and how much is it. I mean, I think it's a, it's a pretty significant amount, particularly here at the high school. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important thing when you say, you know, we're not just, we're not just asking, we're not just coming to you, with, you know, hands out all the time. We're actually seeking funds and adding to that. And so mm -hmm. it, it goes hand in hand. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Also, the pictures uh, in Kingston, I think they did a really good job. I think we talked about this. And, Showing the lifespan of certain things, I think, is really important. And to the town meetings, I think having them in your booklets. And we, I, I, I love my town in the fact that this year we, we show, you know, this is what it looks like. This is this is what it's it's doing. Like this, this has to be funded. And I think it's important for the town people to kind of see what it looks like because just looking at it on a piece of paper, it really doesn't do any good for the town people. But if they can see what it looks like and see that this does need to be repaired and that it does need to be fixed and that. Those kind of things, I think, is really important visually to have those things. Um, and we were discussing also, like, the estimates of certain things are older and they need to be updated. And those are things that are really important to keep up with because those estimates might have gone out to bid earlier to think about it. And then now here it is, you know, lumber, I don't know, my husband's in construction, it's gone way up. You know, those type of things are really important to, to understand that. I think that's where you've been doing a great job this year, kind of showing us what's going on. So Christine and I had introduced to the Safer Committee either at the end of last year or the beginning of this year kind of a new a new process for um, submitting items for the capital plan that would require updated estimates and would uh, encourage things like, like photographs to help explain the story so that when we give information to the town for articles, um, the community has a better sense, but, but also um, you know, our townspeople who are advocating for these items have, have something that they can work on and be confident in the information provided on that document as well. Yeah. And I think that leads to the, the Habib Associates for the Admiral, that's in 2018 report. If you're going to replace that building in 18, it might have been a million dollars construction costs alone. It's not going to be a million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree with you entirely. Um, but I think I want to kind of come to the Admiral building and see if there's any conversation, any comments, any advice even to us on how we might want to approach this. It, it is, I mean, it pained me this past year to have to spend money on windows, not because I didn't want you to be saved, but <laughs> because I know they're not going to be there for their 15-year life. We hope that we're going to have something that's going to be better than that 
split level that was it's been there since the 70s. I want to knock it down. I mean, <laughs> it was built by the CT students. Yeah. It was. Yeah. So there's a legacy in that building. There is a legacy. I but, think it's a, that, that building is so important because they did build it. I think it's, mm -hmm. they built it on hand. I think that's really amazing. It's also, you know, what is the feasibility of keeping that building for something besides admin? I don't know. Sure. Doing something that we can do with this, making it mm -hmm. something that maybe isn't admin, that's so, you know, I don't know. But to me, I think the middle school and high school are great ideas because it, the cost savings is is great. But like you said, demographically, I think it's really important. And I know, like my son's coming up to the middle school next year. There's a big bubble coming up to seventh grade next year, and so those are certain things. Kind of looking at the feasibility of those things, and like you said, 2018, very different now. You know, so I think it's really important to see down the road where we could fit people in, and maybe even if it's just a temporary. Solution as we try to get you know get get through our debt and we can try to maybe work in mm -hmm. doing that. That to me is important. I just want to see safety wise. I've been in there. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, it's something that I've been. We've talked about this for years. I mean, I've been on the committee for a while, and we always talk about the admin building as it just being the last thing that we talk about. And it's never really on anybody's budget. It's never on a budget, but it's the admin of our of our schools, of all the schools, of all three towns. And I think it's really important that all three towns understand this is where these admins reside, you know, and it's really important that they're safe, but th there's also a legacy in this building. And so it's really hard to, to say knock it down where it has a legacy in it and these students built this, but yeah. what can we use it for? And can we renovate it down the road a little bit, but get you guys in an area where we could able, be able to be safe and secure and be in a good space as we think about maybe what's down the road a little bit further. Can we put you in there for a couple of years until we have a little bit more money to do something with it? Yeah, you make a great point. The admin building is not a Silver Lake building. So while my role as Silver Lake, as a school committee member, that building serves the elementary schools just as much as it serves Silver Lake. So it's been sort of our campus maybe supporting it a little more and putting money into repairs and upkeep. Um, and we're happy to do that because we have a capital plan that had fit twenty thousand dollars in it. But I think the town needs to know that if it needs a hundred grand, with our capital plan and situation it is, we may not be able to do that. So we may need to go to Kingston, Halifax, and Clinton Elementary School and say, "Hey, this is your admin building. We need some participation." Mr. Chair, I know. Do, do yeah. I continue? Tom O'Brien has been here patiently sure, sure. to talk about ARPA and whether... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So, You want a tough, tough timeline over there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I didn't. I was aware of that. Thank yeah, you. Thank sure. you. Yeah. Why don't we jump to ARPA then and we can always circle back. Sorry about that, everyone. Probably oh, I didn't know I go to a lot of meetings. Uh, and I get two more to echo a lot of But I really want to compliment uh, the leadership here. The administration uh, does a fantastic job. Uh, the chairman has run a fantastic meeting. Uh, Matt, you're terribly impressive, but uh, I go to a lot of communities and don't see this type of conversation, and people ignore their buildings and their resources, and then they come to us and ask for money to help fund the projects. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're here talking about this is very important. For whatever it's worth, many of you know my experience. You know that I was a state rep, I'm the county treasurer. You probably don't know I started on a school committee here in Kingston. But I'm a big supporter of the stabilization fund idea. I think it, it is an important resource for the school. I understand the challenges that presents. I understand the concern about oversight. But I agree with my fellow treasurer uh, that it really probably is the best long-term solution for whatever that's worth. I received an email, and thank you, Charlie, for copying me on the email. I didn't get an invite, but I saw my name. So I figured I should probably show up for a few minutes and answer a question if they're worried about ARPA. Um, Charlie said in one of the meetings, you know that Plymouth County has received $101 million of ARPA funding for our 27 communities. One question I was asked to answer is, is there a dedicated part of that that goes to regional school districts? Sadly, the answer is no. Um, if you follow ARPA and you read what's been done, you know that there are different tranches of money. There's money available through DESE that is separate from our money. There's opportunities there for schools that can for libraries, by the way. But for the money that we've received, uh, we've decided to follow the model that the federal government has and the state use with its NU money, non-entitlement unit money, and give it to our 27 communities. Now, that doesn't mean those communities can't use that resource for the regional school district as they choose to do so. And you'll notice in CARES that that's what happened. CARES money we administered 
which, by the way, was a huge success for Plymouth County. Our 27 communities received between 1.8 and 2.3 times more money than any other community outside of Plymouth County through the category. So uh, we're going to be diligent with our money, give it to our communities. There are six categories that money can be spent on. We're rolling out a website, which will be available tomorrow, to highlight those categories. Regrettably, I know your next question is, well, what about all these capital projects? I don't see many of them that will fall. Perhaps, and I'm available, you can give me a call anytime. I've read the ARPA Act, the American Discipline Act, 16 times. I think maybe some of that technology might be. Maybe some of track might be. But those are decisions your towns are going to have to make in, in terms of whether they want to dedicate those resources here. Uh, if you're talking capital planning, though, I would suggest you don't rely on ARPA. You don't even consider it as a, a possibility. It may prove to be down the road. The advantage of ARPA is a three-year program. It runs through December 31st, 2024. Uh, and so we'll be rolling this money out in phases. But again, there are six major categories. I could talk about it for the next hour if you want, or, or at least 10 minutes if you're curious. But it really wasn't the focus of your meeting. I just wanted to come and answer those few quick questions. <coughs> You know I'm not adverse to chatting as long as you want to hear any of this stuff. Uh, but I think the questions were special dedication for school districts. No, are many of these monies available for capital projects unlikely? Is will the programming still be the same way that we thought the CARES Act funding would be doing some sort of invoicing to you, to you, or how would we? Is it the same kind of way that we did the CARES Act funding, or was there any way that we would actually submit for the, the funding? So. Uh, ARPA is a little bit more robust than CARES that lasts over a long period of time, and it wasn't designated or intended to be as much of a reimbursement program as CARES was. I think quite candidly the success of the Plymouth County's CARES program is we did it as a reimbursement. That has really saved you folks on audit responsibilities. In fact, we've assumed all those. I see Victoria nodding her head. I know Christine appreciates that from this Clinton standpoint. Um, CARES is going to be a little bit more challenging, so we retain the services of Clifton Larson Allen, uh, a pretty reputable accounting firm. We've developed a uh, one-of-a-kind web portal that will be available to submit. Uh, many of the applications will not be on a reimbursement component, but not all. I know Charlie has a question that I try to call you today, Charlie, uh, to answer that particular question. But most of them, through the infrastructure, we recognize they're a big project. And so you'll get into the portal, uh, and only two or three members of each town will do that. And you'll submit and answer all the questions that we have to answer pursuant to the federal statute. Uh, but we've really got it set up pretty well. Clifton Larson Allen is our first level of review. Powers and Sullivan is our second level of review. And then my office is the third level of review before it goes to the commissioners for signature and signing tips over to the community. Do you know what the timeline would be for that? Um, huh, everybody's going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, we released the, the Plymouth County commissioners, and I really have to commend them for stepping to the plate. Ironically, you'll recall with CARES, we were the only county to take it. Mm -hmm. With ARPA, every county followed us. Every single county eligible for ARPA money took the money, and now they voted to adopt our plan, which is great because it's going to defray our costs. Um, but the timeline will depend on the communities largely. We found with CARES some communities are adept at filling out the application, and the money is getting returned quickly. Mm -hmm. Others struggle with some of that, and so it takes a little longer for us to get the money back. Um, but again, it's a three-year program. The nice thing about working with the county is we're here. Our offices are right at 44 Overy Street. You don't have to worry about getting into Boston. I'm available. Um, I grew up in this area, and so know everybody at the table. And if you have any questions, give me a call. But you would, I can't answer that question. You may have a project that is going to take three years. So it's going to take three years to get to that. You may have something that may only take 30 to 60 days. Tom, what are the six categories? I knew you were going to ask me. <laughs> the two easiest and biggest of what I think most communities are going to find are infrastructure related. The first is water and sewer. And the federal government has really focused on that. They feel that it's a decaying part of infrastructure in the United States of America. And so this bill focuses in on that and really gives a lot of latitude for water and sewer projects. We've heard from our 27 communities, particularly as it relates to PFAS, that there's a lot of issue and, and a lot of need that they aren't prepared to handle. These, these funds are probably a good resource for those types of projects. Second infrastructure is broadly interpreted broadband. Um, 
we're very fortunate to return to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and have access to some of the technology we have and the educational opportunities that we have. It, it might surprise you to know that uh, as much as 35% of the country doesn't have access to the internet. Uh, and so I think the federal government was looking at this as a resource to try to provide and expand that opportunity. However, I do see some technological opportunities for our 27 communities if, if that's the direction they want to go. Um, the other four categories I think will be a little bit more challenging. And I think people have uh, perhaps, uh, hmm. I don't want to say a reasonable expectation, but uh, perhaps exceeding expectations over what these monies can be used for. One is something called premium pay, uh, sometimes referred to as hazard duty pay. And it's an attempt to uh, provide additional pay for those that work during the pandemic. However, the federal government anticipates that you will compensate lower income employees first, uh, those at 150% of the federal poverty level. And so it's very important that any community that considers this as a, an opportunity understand you can't just determine to pay a certain group of employees. You have to look at the employees as a whole, start with the lower paid employees, and work your way all the way through if that's what you want to do. I think most communities will probably not end up doing that, um, but that is one of the categories. Another category is revenue replacement. Revenue replacement is a calculation the federal government provides for you where you can determine from uh, 2019 into 2020 if you lost revenue, and if you did and you do the calculation, and we have one up on our website, uh, that you can get the differential as a revenue replacement into your budget. The advantage to that is it's a one-time influx into your budget. The disadvantage to that is it's a one-time influx into your budget. <laughs> um, and we're concerned because we see some communities thinking they can use it for operating purposes, which of course, Carl will tell you, don't ever do. <laughs> I would also remind you that it's a three-year program, and I'm concerned that some of our communities are using the NEU money for revenue replacement. I think this isn't the year to do it. I think 23, 24 would be the years to contemplate doing that. So we have time. That's a nice thing here. And you can investigate that. The remaining two categories are economic development as it relates essentially to uh, the pandemic. I think that's going to be a little bit more challenging for communities to, to seize that as an opportunity. Again, I think the first two infrastructure are where they really focus their resources. And then the last. Uh, is uh, in response to the pandemic, cost in response to the pandemic. So essentially, I look at this as something that wasn't covered by CARES, that was pandemic related. Our is a little more broad based. So you may have submitted something to us that was rejected uh, because it didn't meet the confines of CARES. You may be eligible on our Those are the six categories. Again, our website is, is going to be live. Uh, it started this evening, plymouthcountyarpa.com. You may have some trouble finding it because we're rolling it out now. It has a front page with those six categories on it. And you can collect There's a lot of information there that we've developed for you. For instance, that revenue calculation, we took it and developed it just for Massachusetts because it was developed federally and there are things, revenue streams that we don't have here. Uh, so we weeded those out and made it a more useful instrument, we think, for our 27 communities. In fact, I will tell you that our plan, the design that we have is now being sought out after by 32 of the other states what we've developed here. Awesome. We're pretty excited about that. Are you going to get a royalty? No, no. <laughs> you know I'm going to try. I don't think so. What I'm going to do is reduce my cost, though. That's for sure. We thought it would cost us about $200,000 to develop this program, pay for it by our but it looks like we can get it for about $50,000. And in the fact that we're coming by you. Already saved you $150,000. Yeah. Earned my keep today. <laughs> Other questions about our book? Yes, so when you talk about protected communities, and we're all in this building wearing masks right now, and students all have to wear masks, and the temperature in this building creeps up over 90 degrees in some places, you going to be able to say that it's definitely affecting learning. This, this requirement that has to be put on the students in school, and what we're being able to do, and when it's an HVAC air conditioning, Yeah, so I, I, I did, I thought I mentioned that HVAC might be an opportunity. Uh, that is something that is clearly focused and you're correct. The guidelines, not just by DESE, but uh, federally and otherwise, you know, are requiring extra work and extra effort. This is a relatively new building. I know you sat there and talked about your capital plan. Um, but if that's a need, uh, you can look at the guidelines and see, but HVAC is something that definitely would be considered. 
I think for schools, HVAC and technology are probably the two. You know, I, I don't think the school operates on a well. Maybe it does. But okay. what? It does not. Okay. So if there are water main, if the town of Kingston is doing a water main project, you know, that part of the funds are available for something. I should, I should clarify, we do have a well here, but that's but for it's not Yes, it's not for a school well. Right. Yes? With um, CARES Act heavy unbudgeted items, is that the same case for our It is not. Okay. How about that for a quick answer? <laughs> 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 also, do you think you have an answer on the HVAC and the HVAC systems? So, Gord, it's really going to depend on the project, so I can't just say any HVAC. You have to make the compelling case, and I, I really enjoyed working with many of your town administrators and many of you on this board of selection. A lot of it is how you board it. If you come and say, well, we've been neglecting our HVAC system for the last seven years, we think it's time to replace it, the answer's going to be no. But if you make a compelling case that given social distancing, a lack of airflow, the design of this building wasn't made for that, and we have to respond to the pandemic, the answer becomes more likely yes. So I can't just give a blanket answer. Mm -hmm. So like air purifiers, things like that, we could... Oh, absolutely. You do that under CARES. Yeah, we um, and, and I will tell you, uh, we just released Plymouth County, and I think some of the selectmen are under the administrators. Now, Plymouth County just released a phase seven of the CARES Act. Uh, again, more money than any other uh, county or any other town are getting. That's at PlymouthCountyCares.com, municipal allotments. Click on that phase seven. If you're all getting even more money under that, uh, I have one or two towns, and this may surprise people, that are saying, we can't use all of this money. Uh, but one thing they are using the money for air pur purifiers, the ultraviolet light uh, for some of their buildings. So they're using that as a resource with the Delta variant. But that's a clear yes under the kids. And, you, and I'll tell you, the three towns have been very good at using the resources. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with uh, the members of Kingston and Halifax. A little biased because it's my old rep district, but. Mm. <laughs> we like that. Thank you. Yes. So number six, the costs from the uh, pandemic. So from the facility side, um, trying to accomplish on time, under budget, or on budget tasks has been very difficult. Supply, material, labor shortages. So this expands the length of a lot of our projects requiring um, more uh, time keeping the building open, off hours, um, uh, wages, overtime wages, is, is that part of costs from the pandemic? So, unlikely. Um, under CARES, no. And by the way, CARES ends December 31st, 2021. So we only have a little time there. I, I would ask everybody to focus on CARES first. Your NEU money second, and then there's ARPA money third. I, I can't see that fitting into this rubric, particularly I understand the case you're making, but it's not what this was intended to do. Now, that being said, the federal government updates its guidelines every other week, so that could change. <laughs> um, I love it. This is all, this is all being made, this is one of my favorite things, under what's called a final interim rule, or an interim final rule. That's how I want to file my taxes. Sure <laughs> These are my interim final taxes. <laughs> I have the case revised in if I want for the next three years. Uh, it's very frustrating for us to manage $101 million, and it's a, a big burden for my office, with these guidelines keep when they keep changing, but we're, we're trying to stay on top of it. I, I don't think those popular challenges are going to be there. Well, well, I'll tell you that I was so impressed with your presentation. Very impressed. <laughs> I'm with a great team. Yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 they're lucky to have you. Other questions about Arbor or CARES? I've never been this popular. <laughs> I like to think it's because I'm fun to be around. <laughs> My wife tells me it's because we're just doing $101 million to get a little bit. But if uh, you ever need me to come back, please give me an invite. It was a little hard to find out via an email. Uh, just give me a call. I'll be happy to come again. Nice talk. Thank you. I wish I'd known you had money tonight. I'm sorry. I wish I'd known you had money tonight. I would have put you off the list. I'm sorry. You <laughs> called me right up. Yes, I was taking notes. I was like, okay, they're going to keep me cool in my heels here. Yes. Can I just ask you a question about reimbursing the towns? Um, as you. The agreement that was made is that the three towns worked collaboratively with, collaborate with us, and we were submitting uh, some of our costs to the towns, and they were submitting it to both counties. Are there, when do you expect that next payment of uh, reimbursements to come out? I used to know that 
phase seven is happening, but are you still reimbursing from CARES Act from last year? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the commissioners just met again on Tuesday and voted another 49 applications. Okay. Uh, we have processed here from the county over 475 applications, mm -hmm. um, which again is the most of any county. So we're, we're catching up on that. I know some people are Thank waiting you. for some of those, but we did 49 packets in every town, I believe, uh, it was on that list. So okay. there'll Thank be more you. coming. I see Charlie now because he's already asked me where the Halifax is going to check <laughs> But it's coming to, don't worry. <laughs> Although I did process one for Kingston today for $351. Ooh. <laughs> 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 and it's not the one I'm waiting for. <laughs> I didn't think it was. <laughs> I didn't think it was, but I wrote that out. Anything else? Again, sorry to interrupt the meeting. I know you have a lot on your plate, but uh, keep up the good work and take care of the facilities. Thanks, Tom. It's important. All right, take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Charlie. Appreciate it. Gordon, did you have more on the opera while we're chatting? You got your, your you were the one to put on the agenda, so. I, I think that the towns should consider spending some of the opera funds on social aid and looking at Perfect. I mean, Yeah, that's that's come up infrequently, but it is uh, on our awareness, and Matt's worked hard on that. Do you want to give a 60 second update on what the HVAC has been since since you're asking? You uh, as, far as, it? as far as costs, do, do, like what you're doing to address it in the past, in the last year or so, I know we've done a small steps, the well, uh, fire things on the, on the middle school. Yeah, and, and uh, to Tom's point, as far as using CARES money, uh, you know, we would, would have been in a difficult situation without these type of funds because we did um, invest quite a bit of money into our HVAC systems across all the towns and the district. Um, you know, from the facility standpoint, you're trying to get your HVAC system, your mechanical system, to just function normally. You're not looking for the best. It's just normal how the building is designed um, in order to um, have that comfortable environment. So, you know, you, you know, in facilities, you're dealing with mechanical failures all the time. So the ability to identify and address those uh, deficiencies and correct them in a timely fashion is is paramount especially in this this health crisis you know uh, one of the the best mitigating techniques is um, creating airflow and having that continuously in in your usable spaces air changes per hour um, we've done uh, quite a bit of uh, testing throughout all of our buildings um, in every single space that was uh, occupied as well as um, indoor air quality um, to measure how much of the CO2 is being pulled out of the building um, in these used spaces. Um, but uh, we've also addressed, you know, failing um, uh, mechanical uh, components. And during the process, uh, you know, looking at not addressing just that immediate problem. But if you're seeing a trend of, this, of a similar problem, how do we address that for the future. A lot of that is in uh, building management system controls. Um, a lot of the facilities, e each uh, the spaces are controlled by blocks or wings where um, as you have um, mechanical failures or aging equipment, um, it's very difficult to manage those block spaces when you have so one of the spaces is, is is failing or is uh, in need of attention, but the other, say, if you're dealing with four classrooms, one of those four classrooms needs the attention. Your building management system is only controlling 12 of those classrooms. So um, while we have been um, addressing some of these issues, we're also um, gearing towards the long-term approach where we can um, run fiber, and this is all within operating, to uh, control individual spaces. So when we have a deficiency or we have an issue in, in an area, we can control that individual space without affecting the entire block. Um, so we've made uh, measures, uh, taken measures um, to have more control of those spaces. Um, 
But you know, a lot of our, our, our spaces are warm, and and it it's you know it's a difficult task, especially with the health pri health crisis. Again, the air movement, air air, air changes per hour. But you know, with every action, there's a reaction. So when you open those windows to get more air uh, airflow in your in your room, you're also introducing humidity, which is increasing the temperature. In the building, um, uh, HVAC, HVAC system is designed to function with a closed environment. You're controlling that closed space. So when you're introducing exterior air, um, environmental water, snow, that's going to now hamper um, the ability for that building to function the way it was designed. So that is that's a that has been one of our. Um, Issues that we, we've been working through is trying to find that happy medium. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I know people are thinking about it. Um, I want to sort of get back to the admin building and, and I want to sort of solicit feedback or at least let everyone know that we need feedback. Uh, the admin building doesn't fall under Silver Lake, like I said before. It's a regional elementary school, middle school, high school building. So even if we look at it from a budgetary replacement, I don't think it falls under Silver Lake's budget to take on that debt. It's not a Silver Lake building. It's a district beyond just this campus we're sitting on tonight. So how we structure any of these projects, I don't frankly know. I don't know if the town needs to take on a proportionate debt or you want to slide it through Silver Lake and somehow acknowledge it with an earmark that our budget goes up and we're paying for something that's really bigger than just Silver Lake. Um, it's one of those crossroads of well, what do we do with the building. How did the admin building even come under? Is it because it was built by CTE? Is that how it ended up coming under this for some I, reason? I think by default it came under Silver Lake because it's here. I don't know if anyone who has long longer than my five years can speak of that, but I think it's just it part, it's, it's, it's visualized as part of this campus. I think that's um, one of the biggest problems, honestly, that we have is that these schools these two schools in the other building are all housed in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And I think when Pembroke was here, you know, 100 years ago, they were the big fish, you know, and mm -hmm. now we're the big fish. And I think it's tough that, you know, it, it is tough because the admin building is specific. These three buildings are all three towns, even though they're housed in our town, mm -hmm. they are all three towns' responsibility. And yeah. they all three towns have t students that go in. And it can, it can fluctuate. And year to year, yes, Kingston's always kind of been the bigger town because we've always, you know, that's where it's been, but it can at some point fluctuate and we, you know, and change the, the dynamic of how, of how things go. I think it's important that mm -hmm. we all have that conversation because the yeah. building is all three, these, these three, three buildings are all three towns' responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris. Can I just add a little yeah. clarity when you mentioned the administration building specifically? That is proportionally charged to the town through shared costs. That is part of the mm -hmm. shared cost budget. And that's the day-to-day -day operation of maintaining our building, paying utilities, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it does it does work out. So it is right. shared among the towns through that format. Right. So Chris, mm -hmm. um, I think the next step is what Jill suggested in doing a demographic study. Because if you look at the numbers in this report, which you know, if you go five years out, it means we're going to be somewhere from six or seven hundred thousand to three million is where that number is going to be. We need to understand where we are on that spectrum. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's nice that they put a number in there for renovation, but that's you're going to end up paying more to renovate it than you're going to be to build a new one. Oh, right. Because I as soon as you open it up, you're going to find extra things. And even if you renovate it in its current form, mm -hmm. You, it's still not going to meet baseline requirements because it's an inaccessible building. Yes. The, the front entrance is inaccessible. Right. I'm aware of that. In yes. and of itself. <laughs> and I've tripped there I don't know how many times, even yeah. though I tell myself when I'm walking up, don't trip. Don't trip there, yes. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's going to be a lot easier for all of us to understand what mm -hmm. to do with this building if we're going into the middle school or we have to build new. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's going to be a big going to be a big nut if you have to build a new building. Yeah. And I think one of my points is this isn't, since while I think Safer and Silver Lake did this assessment, the players and the people who have opinions and have input 
are way outside of Silver Lake as well, and equally as important. Yeah. But I don't know who that is. Now that's just personal. I don't know if we need the selectmen to get involved and try and figure out what they want in an admin building, or the finance committee to figure out how to fund it. Well, I mean, it is kind of bigger I, I, than, I look at it from a safer, but I'm like, I don't want to touch it. just cut down to which of the options is viable, because there's such a huge yeah. cavern between the two of them, and it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then, you know, the other, the other possible piece to that, too, is when you are able to do the demographic piece of it, maybe another option that we have to think about is, is there any other space constraint issues on the campus? I'm particularly thinking of CTE, mm -hmm. where yeah. CTE is limited right now by, the, by its physical space. Yeah. And so maybe there's an opportunity to do something with that and admin if the demographic stuff comes back. Mm -hmm. I guess this building, an entirely new building, is going to have some incremental cost to it because you're creating all new systems, all new everything that's going into the single building. So the way that we've been doing a lot of stuff in, in Plimpton is really trying to make sure that we have an understanding and, and, and the information we need to be able to plan out sure. two, five, ten years. And yeah. I think without, without that study, it's, we're just guessing. Yeah. I think this is so that preliminary give us some bookends. Yeah. I mean, this do. is great yeah. to have. It's yeah. an excellent thing. I've read through the whole Step thing. Step one. Okay. A little while back. But uh, <laughs> that's great to have. But yeah. now we don't know. Now we have our next thing of, OK, so if we go in there, are we going to be in trouble in seven years when we need the classroom yeah. space back? I don't think we went too and now deep. And we, now we knock down the building, we have no place to put them. Yeah. Right. I don't think we went too deep on our needs analysis for what the admin really needs. This no, is really a, really a cursory almost mm -hmm. kind of thing from three years ago. And I think we looked at it and it's kind of sat for a couple of years as we try and digest everything we need to do. And we do have space. I don't know if people know this. We have that island between the parking lots out by the high school that could be another building. Just move your building you have now, and rebuild, you know, maintain what we have, use it during the, a two-year construction period. That was one of the options. Um, and of course, we could always attach somehow to one of the schools if that's uh, a good outcome. But um, just, this is something we would throw out there to a, a lot of key players for, for awareness. So. Is there space available in any of the other towns? I mean, personally, I'd rather see you move out of Kingston. I think it would be a greater sense of ownership if you weren't, if everything wasn't in Kingston. If there was a building here in Halifax or London, sure. you know, this would be perfect for, um, for the admin. And maybe with a project that um, is coming up, we could accommodate space for you, mm -hmm. you know, with something that we're doing either, you know, in one of our towns. Yeah, uh, that, that's kind of the, uh, the input I, I would love personally like to hear because it doesn't have to stay here. It's nice to be here because half the students between the three towns are here. And it makes it convenient for, for administration to at least get to one building quickly, or two buildings quickly. And I think it's a great point because, again, it gets to the point of sharing the cost. I mean, you have a certain amount of money that's going into whatever you're building to begin with, just mm -hmm. facilities and, and infrastructure and all that. Yeah. But that's where, again, we come back to the question of what are the needs. If we have the physical space here and we need to move some walls and paint, put some paint in, mm -hmm. then that's going to be the, by far the cheapest way to do it. You know, if you are putting it into or making another building X amount larger in order to accommodate that because of another project mm -hmm. in another town, that's probably going to be cheaper than building a complete standalone building, but still going sure. to be a number of times above. Yeah, and we have time, I think. I don't think the building is decrepit yet. We have time to kind of get ahead of it. You know, despite putting it on it, it looks. <laughs> it's pretty bad. That wasn't a high high. It wasn't very high, was it? I mean, I tried to be nice. Sorry. <laughs> the, the, only, the only downside to that, and, and that we're, we're looking into now in, in Punta, is that um, I think, uh, you know, the state has up on their site for the schools uh, a, a, a graph that shows over time the costs of building new buildings and how that's increasing against a number of other factors. And it's not a very good curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as a result, they reimburse less. But the more point of that is put the reimbursement piece aside, which isn't relevant here. It's the issue of how each year you, you wait to do something, your costs are going up in a way yeah. that you cannot compete with. Yeah. And so at a certain point, the costs get to the point where you're just not going to be able to do it without a significant financial impact to, to the communities. Yeah. So, yeah. time is time is time is helpful from the debt exclusion piece of that. Mm -hmm. But getting a clear idea of what we're doing is probably not something we have time for. 
we have to kind of figure that out and then be able to figure out what that cost is going to be understanding incremental cost over time. So if you say, we figure out that we can do X, and then we can extrapolate out three or four years to where there's availability for debt, you're going to have an idea of what that project is going to, going to cost. And then that's something that the towns need to think about as far as how they think they're going to fit that into the budget. Yeah, it's a different, it's not school space. It's not teaching space, right. which is, I guess, maybe a, a cost difference that I wouldn't have a clue if it's more or less to build a, a small office building. Office. Yeah, with conference rooms and stuff like that. So I don't know if it's higher or make it, 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 you make it like a, a student space that would be, you know, could you make it into a student space? That's something, again, you could look into too, could you? For Depends on where you house it, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, if it's with a campus or without a campus separate, it makes a difference. But if there are buildings or some other construction going on the town, so you can tag it onto it, that's for the town to decide, not necessarily for the Silver Lake School Committee to decide, I guess what my bottom line point. I, I hear what you're saying too about it being in one of the other towns, I think it's, it's where you are, it's kind of has, has, has a say in it, but they were in the Halifax or something, it might make a, a difference, you know, being seen. But if you get demographics and needs figured out, then we, and then we figure out time, Mm -hmm. Then we can figure out what the options are. Mm -hmm. John, I really appreciate the comment about this, the CTE, that foresight yeah. with that, in, in, maybe incorporating that with the admin building, even, you know, even if that doesn't come to fruition. Um, the fact that, you know, as a community, we're coming together and exchanging these ideas, you know, that's something that I haven't heard of. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing the needs for the CTE. Uh, we're seeing the potential of the CTE. Um, so to address that and incorporate that in an administration building, build, uh, I think is a great idea. Um, but I just appreciate that comment. Thank you. Yeah. Should we move to one, uh, one of the last items here, I guess, or the last on the list? School resource officer. <laughs> Who wants to take this one off? <laughs> that would be me. Oh. Um, so here, here was, here's another issue that, um, that we need to discuss as, as, a, as a community of three towns because it, it keeps resurfacing and, I, and I've only been here for what, three years, three and a half? Am I on four years? I think you're on four. I've got four now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but in, in my time here, it has come up quite a few times um, in, in town meetings in terms of how we fund our school resource officers. And uh, we just want to begin to have that discussion because we, we want to try to um, explain to you some of the parameters that we're working with with regards to school resource officers, but we, we, we recognize that the towns may want more input as to how we go about funding these positions. And I think it's important to note that the, the, the chief of police has explained on, on numerous occasions that, that he, he requires a, a, a full-time police officer. He doesn't hire police officers by school hours or by um, the school year. In addition, we are situated in Kingston, and the school resource, school resource officers that we have proposed in the past have been on our Kingston campuses. So sometimes the community members will wonder, well, you know, why is it a Plimpton officer, or why don't we have a Halifax officer? But the jurisdiction here in this community is Kingston Police, and it is the responsibility and the authority of the Kingston Police Chief to decide who that person is. It's, um, it's not a school position, it's a partnership with our, our local police, and we partner with um, our, our police and fire in our other communities as well, but they all work within the confines of their, um, of their towns. So that's the first thing, because, and it's not that, that anyone here has brought up that question, but we, we've heard that question posed in town meetings, and we just want that a basic understanding of that's why it's a, a Kingston police officer here on our campus. Um, and we wanted to discuss how uh, the towns would propose funding this if it is in fact an issue with the way we have um, presented this proposal in the past. So we'd like to try to address it earlier than usual so that we can, we can try to find a, a resolution um, moving forward. Yes, I <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Kingston doesn't have a problem because it's a Kingston talk. <laughs> well, I think, what, what is our current situation with the, the SROs? We have one, correct? And that's being paid, refresh my memory? The high school one is funded by the town of the city police department. Okay. 
So between the con contribution from Plimpton and Halifax, they are participating in paying for a 0.5 resource officer at the, high at the middle school. And the mechanism for that is? The way it works right now is I get the invoices from uh, the police department. I bring them to Silver Lake School Committee because the towns would like it to be approved by the body that suggested it. Mm -hmm. So it's approved by Silver Lake Regional School Committee, then presented to the towns where they each pay it out of their own separate warrant articles. I think the debate has been with Halifax, it's tradition, those articles are traditionally capital items. So that's the, that's the conflict for Halifax is that they're funding it as a capital item, it's really not a capital item. Mm -hmm. And is a funding risk involved with a warrant article? There is. Yes. Yeah. Because it hasn't been funded for some years. Right, so it's a year-to-year Right, and I imagine the Kingston Police Department doesn't really want to operate year-to-year -year with an officer on or off there. So part of the question on that is that it's paying us an order time and that's part of the issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense. That's Sometimes the problem. it is at overtime. Yes. Yeah. So we have one person, and that's what we're looking to try and figure out the mechanism on, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, actually, both things, both the Kingston police officer. I think for Halifax, when we debated this, it was more, and Gordon could correct me, it was more acceptable if the whole shebang was within the operating budget. Mm -hmm. That, yes, ultimately, Kingston is. You know, we're, Silver Lake is sending a check to Kingston. Kingston gets it as a general revenue. Kingston helps pay for, you know, it goes in its budget and pays for the officer. I mean, mm -hmm. it goes through several cycles of where the money goes, but it was more acceptable with the idea that if we're going to fund the part-time officer at the middle school, we're happy. And, you know, there may be people who don't want police officers to do, but setting aside policy, just the financial issue was mm -hmm. cover the whole thing in the operating budget because we're sending you money right now for the part-time office. Mm -hmm. And if it's a good idea and everybody's willing to fund it, then we're funding it out of the operating budget. That's just a clear right. part of the assessment process. So, so the other part of the equation was you have to add in the full-time officer for Kingston into the budget as well. Right. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, the last couple of years, the towns have told so late that they can't afford the budget that they've done for it. So it needs to be an understanding that this is not an additional item. This is something that's been paid for. It's just a change in where the funding mechanism is. But again, it's a so late budget is a long-term issue. I mean, we didn't even bring up the fact that Chapter 70 didn't have a number. But if you but if you put you're putting then you, let's follow the argument. If you put that into the operating budget, you're putting a full time officer and a half time officer into the operating budget, and then that means that and I'm not saying this by the run, but that means that Halifax and Plimpton pay more. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. No. Actually, when you do the math, though. Kingston is Kingston yeah, is it's a little close. more than half of the yeah a little more than half of the school right? yeah not but, two thirds right but they're but they're paying for a hundred percent of the Kingston officer so I mean I, it would go up a little but it would be a cleaner way of doing it rather than putting um, a, an SRO as an article which is yeah. just an additional yeah. so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. I like that idea myself. <laughs> I like. I. I think it's important to keep it clean myself. But, but I, I think it's hard to put it as a capital item. I think resource officers are so important, and I. I would never want that to not be funded. And I think it's very important to have a resource officer funded as a kid who went through the middle school. Point five. I'd like to see it be full time at some point because honestly, like middle school is like what we had in like fifth grade. I mean, it's just it's a different it's just a different dynamic nowadays, and I think having that officer there. I know my my kids like to have an officer there, and again, you know, coming from a parent point of view, um, I I think having the resource officers are important, and I hate to see them not be funded, and that's a very important thing. Say with you it, again, it's it's something where it's operating budgets need to go up, but if you can explain an operating budget and say these are 
the reasons that it's in the operating budget now and we get clear as to why you have an operating budget. Some years people want to question every little item and some years people just say yes to in, in go. So it really is dependent on on how we explain things as well. And I think it's very important to explain it as, you know, as a cleaner item, we've, we've been funding these, this is not something we haven't funded in the past. It's just a way of going about it so that it is able to be funded continuously and maybe, you know, one year it's not, it just may not be. And that's, that's a tough dynamic to swallow, I feel like, as, as a parent, to know that I may not, may not have a resource officer in, in the schools. But if you do this with the next budget, then it needs to be an understanding through all three communities and, and FinCom and all of that, mm -hmm. that, that that piece of the percentage of increase cannot be held against the, against the, it can't, it can't, it can't, it can't, it can't, it can't, it you can't say, we'll put it in the operating budget and then say, well, yeah. get rid of a couple teachers because you now have that money there. Precisely. That's not mm -hmm. how that works mm -hmm. if, if we're going to look at that. That's why we have, I think, FinCom members here to understand right. and selectmen here to figure it out. What mechanism should we use? And I mean, tell us, and we'll we'll work with it. But we need to put in the operating budget. I think Joe would agree with that. And then don't and ask us to cut two teachers to offset. And, right? and I wouldn't wait till March to have that discussion with income. Correct. I mean, because that should be had. Can I ask right? Deb, who's on our income? But <laughs> <laughs> I would actually defer to Carl because I don't know how it works in our police. And I, I don't know. How But we would probably be charged from the town of Kingston okay. Police Department for the 1.5 officer. So we would pay that expense and it would come back to the town yeah. of Kingston through the, okay. the police department. Because okay. right now your police budget is paying for the right. right. So you can yeah. see the increase in your cost of so play. Yeah. 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 And that's part of the mechanics that the police chief needs to understand his budget would shrink. Technically not, but yes, the budget would shrink because we're going to pay for a piece of it. Um, there, the police department budget will not shrink. Ha what will happen is Kingston is going to end up getting money from Silver Lake, more money from Silver Lake, right. at the same time that it's sending more money, but the actual police department budget should not be changed simply because of how we're funding it. Because they've got to pay. We're paying the wages and such, wouldn't his? No, we would just be paying an invoice. We would not okay. be, they would not be our so employees. So you're making his employees still for us. Yeah, they're still the town employees. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, we can't tell anyone. Right now, the full-time officer is not running through Silver Lake. It's just the part-time officer. Mm -hmm. right. So John's point, the only thing that the two towns are paying for help is to put this stuff part-time. Mm -hmm. So when you do the equations, shifts a little bit. Yeah. Liz and Christine, do you know what kind of an article the town of Plimpton uses to support that? It's, it's not a capital uh, article for the town. It's just a general, general. general okay. funds. Um, sometimes it's been funded out of the Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. The, the award article gives us the ability to choose the body of source. To decide that right. for the town. So we, get to, we usually specify the funding source maybe a few days to a week before mm -hmm. town meeting. All right. I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Historically, yeah. our FinCom has um, liked the way that Silver Lake has proposed it. Um, they are of the mindset, or at least they have been thus far, that they like the townspeople to see exactly what they're paying for, as opposed to burying it in a larger operating budget. Mm -hmm. um, that said, it's, it's an important factor in being able to have that resource officer um, we funded it, I believe, the last two or three years. That you voted positively for it each year it's been presented. Yes, yeah, so obviously for us it's something that's important to our residents and something that we would want to keep going. So if it makes it easier on Silver Lake and for Halifax to kind of deal with that, if it were part of the operating budget, I don't think we'd have a problem with that. We would just want to educate our finance committee members mm -hmm early on, so like John Wilhelmson mentioned, so that they're not holding it against you <laughs> as we get to like yeah. April. <laughs> no, that, that's exactly like the conversation we want to get in front of, because we keep getting stuck in that yeah. March time frame of Right. No, we to iron it out ahead of time, but I don't think we would have any significant preference. Um, it's just a matter of kind of knowing what, what we're doing. Okay. If you an opportunity to talk about it, which is nice, because it is important. Yeah, I think, I think we've had 
virtual unanimous consent that it's important and we need to fund it. It's just the other mechanics of three town operations, I guess you can, with, with one town being the police department. So, so we can work through that between now and budget season with a thumbs up? Good. Makes me happy. Mm -hmm. That works. Yeah, works for all of us. Thank you. Anything else from your end, I guess, from everyone else here that we didn't sort of put on the agenda? We can't talk too far, but if there are items that we should communally connect on at some point. I would like to see a proposal on the um, what you're planning for HVAC before we make any type of commitment. We've got to look at our own needs for mm -hmm. this, um, our own money first. And yep. We need to have a full picture of uh, what it looks like before we can make that. I really see the importance of it, but we've got important needs too, and mm -hmm. there needs to be some balance. Sure. Yeah. The second floor of the middle school is really fine. <laughs> And I think also it would be good to, if, if possible, to, to try and at least keep sort of a projection for the capital plan of what you think is coming in, what you think isn't, and where that, where those, the point earlier, where those lines cross. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just, just visually, I think it would be helpful for everybody to be able to, to watch that as we have to, because we're going to have to address something at some point. Yeah. And either that's moving some things into the operating budget, which gets back to our other discussion with the resource officer, if you're going to move it there, then everyone's going to understand that. Yeah. Or whether it's some sort of a stabilization fund, or whether it's some sort of additional amount yeah. that's coming in each year. And I think, I think it's just, we need, we need to see it coming, rather than saying, oh, well, now we're here, and now we need X, because yeah. we're all trying to plan out, and it's... And everything just costs more. Yeah, it, it's it, the variability on our side. I think for Silver Lake is the E and D. We can't easily forecast whether we're going to save our funds or we're going to get the revenue from the solar panels. And the project side is easier for us to manage. Yes. It's, it's the revenue and what that. What, we don't even know what our budget or is. Or it could be as simple now. as, for instance, last year when to um, accommodate students being in school, we had the HVAC system running almost 24 hours a day at, at peak. And we had windows open, and so all of our heating costs and our electric costs with all the air purifiers, mm -hmm. I could never have predicted anything like that that we'd be doing that. So that's influencing our budget. That's an amazing influence on our budget. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm, I'm going through that, I'm concerned. What is the next thing I can't even imagine? No, I, know. I guess what I'm thinking of is more something like taking you know, averages and estimates and putting them out there, and then having that discussion when things yeah. don't come to the, you know, doing a projection I think would help both to understand and help, to, help, to help people to understand the variability of how we can estimate this and it just doesn't right. work. And if you look at but the spreadsheet that was presented today, one of the things that had a big influence was Pembroke when that settlement mm -hmm. finally happened. Our E&D was exceeded everything. Right. And then one of the things that we have to do when that exceeds 5%, we had to return to the towns in some form. So mm -hmm. we've done that. So I think you can tell in the past six or seven years how we've slowly eroded any of that surplus that was there. So yeah, yeah. You know, now we're getting down to, if we continue to fund at this kind of a level, we may have $200,000 left in our E&D after that. But, and then it could just be influenced by... Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. I think we need to have more conversation about the stabilization project. Yeah. It really it came as out of the blue. Yeah. We had no mm -hmm. idea it was coming. It was like, what is this all about? <laughs> <laughs> and now you want more money. So um, I agree, you know, for planning purposes, it would certainly be beneficial. But I think we need to have some good yeah. discussion about this, what we're talking about for money. What your plan is to use the money, mm -hmm. and are you know, paint the, the lines on the passport paint? It just, you know, we need to know yep. what it's for, and I think we would feel a lot better about supporting it. Yeah, I, just being a we, we threw that out there as a unfunded account, essentially. We wanted to communicate that we see this might be helpful down the road. Let's put it as an article, and we didn't. I don't think we had any dollar to it. It was just it was let's here. open an account. Yeah. It's all it was last year, right. and I think that it may have been a a more blunt method than maybe we should have used, versus this kind of conversation. Hey, maybe we can talk about this and get this going. Um, it was unfunded, and we had no real expectation. We hadn't done the analysis of how we should fund it, or what level we should fund it, or what can Halifax, Clinton, and Kingston afford to fund it at. 
Um, but I think the, the idea was it's information that we think is so important, we want to let people know about it. That's why it kind of came out maybe a little blunt. So I apologize if that was the, the way it was received. There are a lot of things that will be perceived differently this year. Yeah. Yeah. Good discussion. Yeah. And where we can speak to it because mm -hmm. we know what the plan is. Yeah. Where we didn't last year. Yep. Just like, and it, well, yeah, we, we left it unfunded and figured unfunded is no harm, I think, in my eyes, but it wasn't necessarily harm. It didn't work that well, sorry. My PR wasn't so hot on that one, I suppose. The only other thing that we don't have on the agenda that we all need to talk about is the original Yeah, I, we do need to set we're, up a time for that. We are. We're, we're working, um, we're going to be working on that with, Sil with Silver Lake. Um, in particular, reviewing the agreement and then um, determining whether or not there are any necessary changes. Um, when we last looked, it looked like the, the weighting would remain the same basis, based on the, the census data, if I recall. Um, so the, the voting, let's see. You can't go down too far down this road because of open meeting, right? Yeah. Yes, we're on it. <laughs> it, is, it is on the Silver Lakes agenda um, as a committee to try and figure it out. Yeah, and that has to get adopted town, of course. Yeah. I hope when you guys get processed and there's some uh, HVAC system, we can have an opportunity like this. Uh, okay. So, um, to your point, is it, if it's so, it's the will of, of Plimpton and Halifax, is it also Kingston? Would you, as far as, figures for HVAC improvements, AC. What is, what would be the best um, conduit of information to, pre to present to you? Is it per classroom? Do you want an assessment on what a whole building AC upgrade would be? I'm going to defer to my town properties committee. I mean, I, I, think, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, mean I, I think we need to understand what the recommendations would be, and then rough costs. You know, so if it's going to if it's going to use up, let's say, 10% of Plimpton's funds out of that, that might not be a bad thing. If it's going to use up 60%, that's probably a non-starter. So where so, would the so, towns be most comfortable with that okay. as, as far as presenting just costs from, you know, from my department? Or are we going to want to have an assessment done to have it in a report, expected costs, time frame, materials, the whole bundle? Or I, I, I would start with a back of the envelope and what are we talking about because you know we, we know what monies are available to the towns through the through the county and you know if, if if a whole you know if a whole AC for the for the building ends up being a number that's just not approachable why should we get a report to tell us to do that right I mean if, if I think we need to have some idea about what we might be talking about understanding that that numbers are only as good as the moment you put them together right now Correct. but but that will at least give us a benchmark to even understand where this might fit you know what i mean i i don't have any idea of what it would what it would cost to do full ac or if you're going to do a part of it how does that work and is that beneficial or is that costing us three times as much per classroom to do it than it would be to do the whole thing Mm -hmm. I'm, kind, I'm kind of what, without what, information. What the opera, opera is going to be looking for, right? what kind of documentation are they going to be looking for too? If we can do that, you know, kind of getting that, kind of going through with them, like kind of getting that rough set with them, like what are they going to be looking for for um, to approve that? So maybe kind of getting that yeah. started too, because you know it can be rough estimate, but also like are they, are they going to need an assessment? You know, if they're going to need an assessment, probably just get an assessment because if we're going to right. need it for the upper funds, we might as well do that. So I think. Tomorrow, when we find out what exactly they kind of need for um, to get the funds, I think it'd be so. I mean, I think yeah. that would be the town's decision to um, to dedicate um, a certain percentage or a portion of those ARPA funds to um, have an assessment done, or if we just provide um, the uh, per classroom, per wing costs, and the language to um, uh, to explain the need for ARPRA 
ARPA and and see how that goes. Therefore, bypassing a, an assessment cost. Yeah, I, I think we just. I, for me personally, I just need to understand how they go. Bread I mean, zero we need this. Right. Yeah. I mean, just, it, it, well, here's just part of it. Here's just a thought. So if if we say okay, we're going to do one wing and it's going to cost us, I don't know, eight hundred thousand dollars to do one wing. Are we ever going to do another wing? Seriously. I mean, if we if we we're, we're, we're not even if we're worried about paying for an administration building that is an absolute disaster right now. <laughs> are we going to put eight hundred grand into another wing and another wing and another wing? No, we're not. Correct. I mean, yeah. at least not anytime soon. At least until or not with or Well, you know, right, right you can, or some other great amount of money coming from Washington. So, and what's the greatest need? Where is the greatest need for those ACs? Is right. it on the second floor of the middle school that is like harder than some other areas of the school? Like I think there needs assessments of where are the targeted areas that really do need this, mm -hmm. as compared to maybe some other areas that maybe aren't as, you know, yeah, as hot. And, I guess. Like, and, I and think there's no the saying that we, that I mean because. You know, we don't have the issue in Plimpton because we had a little mold issue and therefore had to put AC into the building, which was a saving grace at the time because it probably cost us a fraction of what it would do today. But, and summers are getting warmer and they're lasting longer and all of that. And I mean, at some point, you're probably going to have to bite the bullet, but I think we just need to understand, Charlie's point, how many zeros are we talking about and, and that we can quickly do the math in our, with our, you know, percentages and understand what that might do, and then that can help us give some guidance to what we might be able to proceed with and try to come up with a plan on it. Great, thank you. Yeah. We'll get that. I wonder if our ability to use our mind will diminish the plan if we're trying to the pandemic by saying the masks make it harder to breathe and everything like that. So if we delay it too much and the mask mandates are lifted, are we going to have that same kind of strong tie to the pandemic that allows us to use our mind? That would be a concern that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the right This is the type of thing that the, the money's going to have to be committed before we're going to push ahead with it. This isn't going to be a reimbursement. You know, so time is of the essence here. I think time is of the yeah. essence to just get a get a ballpark of it, and then we can. I can, you know, I, I think from at least Clinton's perspective, we can give you a pretty quick feedback. You know, we don't have numbers to some of the other things we need to do, but we can start to work on that too, so that we have an idea of what maybe we can use out of it. Other issues as other communities start to be doing the same thing, those cost projections <laughs> So, if we're going to move on this, we should move on it. So, I think you can provide those numbers and we all have another meeting the next month. Approve or not approve, but have Tom come back in. Have a conversation. Yep. So, I can provide those rough numbers. Uh, Fairly soon. Do you have an Within estimate tonight? <laughs> I mean, I do. Um, I mean, just for one classroom. So the beauty of these schools in design um, was that the existing HVAC system was designed to have air conditioning. So some of the uh, infrastructure for AC is in this building and it's in the middle school building. Um, the piping uh, in all the classroom unit ventilators for AC is run through the walls and up to the ceiling, uh, up to the roof deck, within a foot of the roof deck. Um, I was hesitant to really go forward with that thinking because of the age of the original AC construction, where it used uh, uh, R22 refrigerant, which is now no longer used. With that refrigerant, um, the old refrigerant, it didn't require the, um, the uh, bonding of the piping to what it is now. The more efficient refrigerant that is used now requires um, either brazing or clamping. So our fear was until we dug into the walls that it would have been a simple soldering of the joints. So we've identified the fact that they were not soldered. So there's a great potential that we can use the existing piping. Um, and with that being said, we can drop uh, condensers on the roof, um, crane them up on the roof, 
and and you would you would approach that in blocks of four. So you'd have a cluster of four, and that would run second, first floor. So um, just rough costs for electrical, you know, soup to nuts on an AC per classroom in the high school um, with the electrical. I'm seeing as uh, twelve to thirteen thousand dollars per classroom. Um, in the middle school, um, still not clear on the electrical side of it because we got to find how long the, the the run is to the power supply and cabinets. Um, but rough rough estimates with that is in the eight to nine thousand dollar range per classroom. Jim, Kayla. <laughs> All right, Jim, you go first. <laughs> so we have six classrooms per pod, and then on, and we have three pods per floor, and then you have an additional, let's say, two classes on the wings beyond the pods. You're gonna make us do math. <laughs> so, so you're probably talking about if you if, if if we were prioritizing, right? If we're looking and say, hey, what are we gonna prioritize, right? Some of the things that you want to think about is okay. So where's where's the heat being held, and it's on the on the top floor. I mean, it, everyone would look at it and say it's the second floor of the middle school. We call it the third floor because we call it the library level the second floor. But that is where the majority of the heat's being held, and that's where you're getting up into the 90s um, when it's in. It. So anyway, if you look at it that you looked at that, you're probably talking about. There's about 22 classrooms, but if you also prioritize the usage of the classrooms, which would be a second factor in your mind, and you'd want to be saying, okay, well, is this classroom you utilize more than 60% of the time for the day? Yeah. Because we have specialist classrooms up on the third floor as well, which are not used 60% of the time. So you factor those things in, you're probably down to around 17 on that floor, but you might want to consider the band room, which acts like a floor because there's nothing above it and the sun shines in through the rooftop. So I'd say 18 classrooms, and uh, the person that installed our hallways for us to take the humidity out of the hallways, which was one of the biggest problems we had in middle school because that humidity would coagulate in the hallways and it would feel like 100 degrees mm -hmm. up there. That same gentleman went in, went into the classrooms, and so he was saying eight thousand, and then um, you get a figure like, like we were talking about, maybe eight hundred to a thousand for the electrical. But so you're at you're at twenty rooms at ten thousand. Mm -hmm. So you're two hundred thousand, but that's not everything. That's prioritizing. And I would yeah. say at the high school, we're looking at, at about fifty spaces at a minimum. So fifty spaces at a minimum prioritizing. So you're at you're at. That's not prioritized. That's 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 total. That's our space being used all day. That right. So it's so it's six hundred. It's six hundred for the mm -hmm. six hundred for the high school, and what maybe three for everything at the middle school. So you're at nine hundred thousand. All at a million dollars. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that would be hundred thousand out of our bill for Clinton. That's so three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a third of our. Well, that's the one piece. There's two parts to the ARPA. And we have 700. Yeah, you because know, we're getting 2.3 mil. We should get about a mil, probably. No, I think it's seven and change. I'm sorry, what? Wasn't it seven and change? Because there's the two pieces? So that's debatable, no. Um, <laughs> um, we're at about, call it 312,000. We got one disbursement for like one. The same amount about one year from now. Mm -hmm. The rest of our money would be tied up with the county. Mm -hmm. right. And that's being administered um, based on my understanding from the seminar I was on, and I think Charlie was on mm -hmm. there too. Um, that you apply to them, like on project by project. Yeah, but I think that's what we go for for, for this. Yeah. yeah, so there's a general allotment, but it would be dependent upon like, those individuals. No, no, I think that's I think yeah. that's the focus for something a project like this right. that we would go right. for an application. You would you would it's look for approval. It's unclear though if you're going to make it up to like that allotment on the, the charts that were sent out to everybody. Well, so 
So I think that would be so a question for Tom. So the communities come in first from well, the county and our... Well, that's for CARES. For ARPA, it's... I mean, the county's basically said it's a per capita basis. So you should have a set number yeah. on that chart. We have that number. It wasn't seven. Huh? Right. Okay. If it's $300,000 in Halifax, it's sort of a slight number. Also, we're considering those under the under cost of the energy for having AC throughout support. So, we can check that. Although, the interesting piece in Plumpton is I don't think our energy consumption was much changed at all over the course of the year because we didn't have windows open because we had we have we had we had units in every room yeah. and so we were cycling we, we and we opened them what pretty much full open for fresh air um, and we saw almost nothing in energy costs so it's like if you keep the building closed properly Correct. and properly ventilated for safety then and, and to that point that is the exciting thing about this HVAC addition using the existing uh, plumbing infrastructure we have. A lot of school systems are going with the mini duct splits where they have little suitcases on the outside of the building, which is an eyesore, but it provides cooling, but it doesn't provide the air changes per hour. So with this technique, we're utilizing our existing univentilators, which is bringing in the fresh air. And we're, so we're working right to just as heating it would be cooling. So we're, we're, we're staying with air changes per hour, whereas a mini ductless split, um, you're not getting that air exchange during the cooling times as you would during the heating times. So that's exciting. So that would help during the winter as well as the summer? So kind of it would just function the same as it would in the winter um, as it normally has been. There wouldn't be, um, there wouldn't be a change in the, in the heating protocol. Would this be something that you would do during the school time, or is this something that would need to be done during the summer? I guess it depends on the timing of when. Yeah, disruption of learning would be would be pretty. I mean, we're going to be up on the rooftop. There's going to be a crane. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not to say that portions of the project could be completed during uh, an April vacation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe they crane everything up off during the week and then it's plumbing and electrical mm -hmm. during operating times. Yeah, well, that's great. We can get it done with that. That's awesome. Sure. After we figure out where numbers are, we have the rest of the sure. estimate is what we're talking about. So, can we get an idea? Okay. One month, six weeks, something like that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're going to work with you guys. The green post that is all 3,000 weapons as well. Sure. So we can make a decision that way. Sure. Sure. I appreciate that. Yeah. We did. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't make any decisions. No decisions. Just in case. I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone coming out tonight, giving us two and a half hours of time on a midweek and moving this forward for us. I, mean, I appreciate it. Um, and we'll get you back to you with another meeting in six weeks, four weeks, whenever we can. Um, put this before Thanksgiving and try to address some of these items and, and figure out the path on some of the bigger things like the admin building or what have you. Thank 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 you.